Danielle Wilson is a 37-year-old working-class transgender veteran running a nonpartisan grassroots congressional campaign for California's 38th Assembly District, where a certain other someone might live. He was born and raised in Maryland by a hardworking single mom. Daniel started working at 14, came out as a lesbian at 16, and graduated from high school the year after 9-11. Unable to uh, break the poverty ceiling, Daniel joined the United States Navy at 24 and served four years supporting the troops in the Middle East. After separating from the military, Daniel married the love of his life and came out as transgender. He utilized his GI Bill to attend college and become the first generation in his family to earn a degree. It was the combination of his working class upbringing, wartime military service, his transition from female to male, and the 216, uh, 216 the 2016 Bernie Sanders campaign that came together to ignite a political fire that drove him to get involved. He began volunteering at the polls, hi got hired at his local county elections office, and now he's running for the state assembly to fight for a better California for all of us. Everybody, wake welcome to the show, Daniel Wilson. Hey, Daniel. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Emily, for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> well, thank you so much for writing a wonderful introduction. <laughs> Full transparency here on the transgender. Show. Oh, completely. It was funny. We um we actually talked about that last night on transistence of like you know um we actually have a theater actress in our midst on that show. We have three hosts, and my co-host, one of the co-hosts, Jeannie asks Marla, um so you know what's your take on on like behind the scenes stuff? Do you have you kind of learned through your stuff to you know through your um you know progression and all of that to keep that on the back end and not address it and she's like no i always bring it up and i'm like yeah i can't seem i know i've been through toastmasters and all that i'm i'm educated and i know how to not do that you move on and don't address it and so nobody knows nobody's the wiser but um i don't know i think i have fun like making fun of the things that go wrong or this little things like <laughs> thank you for the good intro well <laughs> it was yours so it should it should be a good one um, <laughs> I'm going to get through the silliness after I say hi to Mimi. Mimi, hey. Um, and we've got um, 420 still here with us. Kari, all the mods. Um, Heather, Danny, Midvani, Jeannie's here, the aforementioned. And let's see, what else? What did you mention? You're in Discord for Transverse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think we should be... Um, I think we're sh we should be running live at the same time in Discord, which is a cool new thing that Rosa and Justice Renee set up. So, yeah, hopefully that'll bring more people over to here to take part in the chat. And that gives them the opportunity to be able to ask their questions. Nice. Let's start with my questions. Uh, one of my favorite ones to start with is always, how did you choose your name? Uh, um, <laughs> mine is actually a really easy story. Um, so uh, my, my birth name is Danielle. So, um, and from a very early age, it's really funny that later uh, name issues that we had, because at a, at a very young age, as soon as I got to an age in school where they asked you, what do you want to be called? I immediately, Danny, 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 immediately, because at home, my mom would not let me be called Danny. And it wasn't even a male, female thing. She was just like, if I wanted you to be called Danny, I would have named you Danny. Your name is Danielle. I'm calling you Danielle. Um, and she was just very, very firm on that. Um, so uh, as soon as I was old enough to give my, give what name I wanted to be called, I immediately switched to Danny. I think it was like nine, 10 years old. And I've been Danny ever since. Um, so for me, it was just kind of a natural, a natural progression. I just went with Dan Daniel instead of Danielle. So I just cut the last two letters off. Nice. Was there any intent in that to, to kind of honor what your parents had named you or anything? Or are you just like, this has worked for me for so long. It's, it's easy enough to just keep, continue to go with it. Yeah. Uh, especially since um, most of my friends and family were fully supportive. And, and like I said, already called me Danny and, Danny was the, you know, already the male version of Daniel. So um, I got really lucky in that there wasn't a lot of um, uh, transitioning for the name, as it were, um, for, for friends and family. So um, I think it kind of already just fit and uh, was already, you know, comfortable with everybody. So I just kind of rolled with it. I think if, you know, if I hadn't gotten the opportunity as a, as a younger child to start exploring with Danny, my, my story might have been a little different. But I think since I had already found that comfort zone, I just stuck with it. Awesome. So, um, you know, we mentioned in your in your bio when you identified uh, you came out as a lesbian. 
What was it that finally, um, you know, how old were you when you finally realized that you were transgender? What was that moment like for you? Um, well, I guess the, the best way to describe it would be the, the way that one of my best friends responded when I told her, duh. <laughs> um, it, uh, as soon as, as soon as it clicked, everything made so much sense. And it was like, why didn't I think of this sooner? Um, and especially in my situation where it wasn't necessarily from an early age that I uh, necessarily knew I was in the wrong body. Um, I got lucky that I, I, I grew up with four cousins, uh, older male cousins that, um, we all, we all went fishing and, and rode dirt bikes and, and played together. So, um, it wasn't really until puberty that my body began to, to bother me. Um, but, uh, but I do remember specifically, like, I remember telling my mom at like four years old, I want a boy haircut. I was really excited when I got my first pair of boy tennis shoes. I was running around showing them off. Um, they didn't have flowers or anything on them, right? They had the sports or like a, a Adidas ones or whatever. So I did always enjoy those things in boy clothes but hadn't fully put together um, the full, you know, the being born in the wrong body, not, not feeling like myself. Puberty definitely got, you know, really weird as, as things started to develop and, and things started to happen. Um, uh, as I understood that I was, or believed that I was a, a lesbian as a female, that kind of started to make sense too. I was like, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm just a tomboy. I'm just the more, you know, dykish lesbian, the more masculine lesbian. Um, and I embraced that fully. I was hell yeah, I'm a dyke, you know, let's do this. Um, and so it kind of gave me, I, again, I feel like I was very fortunate that I had uh, a kind of alternate outlet that still let me embrace and exist as some form of male. Um, and so I fully relished in that, um, just literally dove head first. I absolutely, once I, once I, embraced being a lesbian and came out that way. Um, just, uh, it seemed to make a lot of things click to where I didn't really need to think about it for a long time. Um, the partners that I was with referred to me as handsome instead of beautiful. Um, and, uh, I would get misgendered in public, but the way I wanted to be right. Like the people would call me, sir. And I wouldn't correct them. And my friends were like, why didn't you correct them? And I'm like, cause that's cool. Like, I don't know. Um, so I would say that, it was probably in my time in the military when it really got a lot more difficult mm -hmm. um, being forced to wear the female uniforms that are very different and there's no need for them to be different because not all of our uniforms are different. Um, and so just different things like that where I, I couldn't still have that freedom to have an outlet to be comfortable in any way. I had to be, you know, told I was told what to wear from sun up to sundown. Mm -hmm. Um so I think that's really when it started to to hit a to hit a head to where I, I didn't have that escape anymore. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate to serve under while Don't Ask, Don't Tell got repealed. So there was a little bit of, you know, in a different way, a little bit of celebration of freedom there that we, we no longer had to worry about being kicked out of the military for loving someone. Um, and I think that and then the, the, just the support of the, the person that I was dating at the time allowed me to keep asking and, and seeking deep, deeper questions about what if I do this? Can this be possible? Is it real? Um, and we, we kind of went from there. That makes a lot of sense that, you know, you would have this identity and, you know, it's working for you. You've, you've adapted to the terminology. You, you shouted it from the mountaintops. And then um, you were able to just basically express yourself however felt correct for you. And then once you were forced back into the other gender, that's that. It, and like I said, it makes sense that that would be a, a major trigger for you. Yeah. So um, how was it? So you, you adapted that identity and came to terms with it relatively easily. The, you know, the lesbian and, and that fit for you for a while. What was it like coming to terms now um, as an adult in the military with this idea of being transgender? Um, were, were there hesitations and kind of some fears that were built into that acceptance of that identity? Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and to be honest, while I say that my embrace of it um, was kind of quick and easy, um, I am belying a point that I, what I didn't realize is that there was something 
in my past that made me put down a firm blocker to never allow me to push it farther than, than clothing. Um, and I actually mentioned this in, uh, in the speech that I was, I was giving the, the night that I met you at the wonderful Transgender Day of Remembrance here in Oxnard, um, that uh, the, the movie Boys Don't Cry, um, I watched that when I was 16, a friend of mine showed it to me. And um, yeah, that's basically, I was like, okay, I don't want any of that life experience. And um, even though I've gotten a lot better, I'm a lot more confident and comfortable, especially as my facial hair came in and I started to pass a lot more. <clears throat> but to this day, I, I still really flinch when, I, when I'm about to walk into a bathroom because of what happens to the, the male in the movie. Um, Brendan, I'm forgetting that first name right now. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I, I buried it deep down inside. I, I embraced the lesbian that, that, like I said, gave me the freedom to, to play with that. Um, and so when, when it did start to come to a head in the military, I still was very resistant also because there's still rampant sexual assault in the military. And yeah. um, so all of that just kind of, so while I allowed myself to start thinking about it and, and pondering it, <clears throat> I got out of the military uh, probably about six months later after I, I fully started thinking about this and asking questions about looking into surgeries and, and possible you know, ways that, that I would move forward with any type of transition. Um, but it wasn't until I got out that I started started taking, taking any moves. Um, I separated from the military in uh, June of 2013 and it was a good two year process of my wife and I, um, you know, going through things, deciding what we wanted to do, getting into therapy. Um, and so I started my transition in 2015. Um, so I was already out of the, the military when I, when I did decide to start and I wouldn't have, if I had reenlisted, I, I probably would have pushed it off even further. Um, so I, I'm glad that I decided to get out at that time so that I could you know, move forward with that. Yeah. And have that time and space for yourself to, to get into it. Yeah. At that period, did you have a, a role model or a confidant, somebody to, to look to, or, or more specifically someone to, to ask questions of and get a little guidance? Again, yes, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate. Um, I, at the time I didn't know this person. Um, they were someone online. I have now gotten to meet them once, um, when they came out to LA, um, his name is Aiden Dowling, and he is amazing. He is a trans male, um, uh, trans activist. He, he tours all over the country now, um, speaking at places. Um, he came out as, as transgender and really lived the most public life I had ever seen a transgender person live. And that's really when I started. I think I found him right about the time that I was getting out of the military. And so that's when I started, like, Oh my, you can just do that. Like he was just living so openly and comfortably doing full hour YouTube where people just ask him questions about surgeries and what he, and he was just so open and transparent with himself, not only for us and the people asking questions about what we might want to go through, but for friends and family members who, you know, want to find out how to support and, you know, community members who might want to, so there's, he was just such a great person and a great resource and, and lived his life so openly and honestly. Um, so yeah, he was, he was definitely watching him was, a that was, that was the final point that I was like, I, I can do this. I can do this. And so oh, that's, that's, that's why I know how important representation is being able to see yourself exist somewhere else outside of your head and in this, this make-believe world that we create to, to survive. It's really important. Yeah. So now we'll move into, you know, now that you've come to accept yourself and, and come out, well, yeah, and just accept, accept yourself in this identity. Now it comes to coming out. What was that experience like for you in general? How did you make those steps? Like, um, I know some people use a, a letter or uh, some people just like bandaid it with a Facebook post. Others will do a lot of direct you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, what approach did you use? So mine was um, um, mixed, mostly, mostly over the phone, um, some in person. I, so I was born and raised on the East Coast. So the majority of my um, fam, all of my family and the majority of my friends um, uh, from before 
I left for the military in 2009 are all still back east. <clears throat> so for all of them, they got a phone call. Um, what I would say is uh, I started with friends first because um, quite a few of them I started um, letting them know when I started explore, exploring the process, when I started, you know, looking for a therapist, when I started, you know, actually going to make the, make the moves. Um, my wife was, I was about to say she was the first, but I actually think I told one of my best friends first. I asked what they thought. And, and, and I don't know if this is the same for anybody else, but for me, I kind of always did things in weird phases. Like I started thinking about what if I just got a mastectomy? It's like, I just always hated my boobs. Maybe if I just cut them off, I'll just be happier. And I just don't have to go through a full sex change. Like, um, and so that's how it started for me. And so I, I, I called one of my best friends and I was like, Hey, what do you, what do you think if I just did this instead of not the hormones and all of this and, you know, just, just cut off my boobs. Um, and so that's where, where I started verbalizing and asking. Um, so the second person was my wife and then uh, my, some of my friends here, the last important call was to my mom and that was the hardest. I don't even remember how, how long I put that off for, but um, probably just a couple months as I started going through um, the the testosterone and stuff. And I can't remember if, um, cause my voice didn't start changing really soon. So I, I can't remember, but something compelled me. I was like, I can't, I can't not keep it from, from her anymore. I have to, I have to let her know. Um, and, you know, f- full disclosure, when I, when I came out as, as, as a lesbian, she accepted me and still loved me, but always said that it, it's not the life I want for you and, and never really understood it um, at, initially. But fast forward 10 years later, and she was the one helping my wife get ready for our wedding when I was marrying her as a lesbian. So, you know, my mom is old. It takes a little while, but she she definitely um, um, comes to the plate. Um, and so I have some good news on that front as well. So when I told my mom, um, immediately her first question was, where is this coming from? Because here's here's how I said it. Is I said, um, mom, I got something to tell you. Sorry, I'm going to try not to, but it's probably going to cry. I'm gonna, probably going to cry. Um, so it's I said. Okay. Um, it's okay here, definitely. <sighs> so I said, uh, I said, hey, mom, I got something that I really need to tell you. I said, I, I need to be your son. I don't want to be your daughter anymore. And uh, her response was, ah, where is this coming from? And, you know, when I tell that story to my friends, um, I've looked like this since I was 15. Um, I had longer hair, but um, uh, after, as soon as I got my senior pictures done, she said I could cut my, I could do whatever I wanted with my hair. So I cut it this short and dyed it black. And she was like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, But so since, since I graduated high school, I've I've basically always looked like this, um, except for in the military when I I grew my hair out so that I didn't look so much like a lesbian. Um, Mm -hmm. But everybody else, like I said, my best friend's response was, duh, I just been waiting for you to, to figure it out yourself. My mom's honest response was, where is this coming from? Um, and a friend actually, an, an older friend helped me understand that no matter how you think you look right now, your parents always see you as the child that you were at two, three years old. It's kind of um, memorialized. memorialized in, in, yeah. Say again. Sorry, uh, sorry. I, uh, I have a, a dog growling in the background. That oh. dog, the dog, <laughs> he's I, I the dog wants, to, wants um, to play and thus is growling at me. And I um, turned off my mic so the audience couldn't hear it. And I was trying to yell at him. I should have hit the button so that you couldn't have heard, heard me talking to him. Apologize. Um, no, it's totally okay. It's totally okay. Uh, I have two furry friends behind me as well. So, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, that helped me understand because I was really shocked that I just was just like, how could she not see how I've been living for so long. Um, but yeah, so having, so for any, any, any transgender people out there that, uh, or questioning or non-binary or any, any place where you exist on the, on the spectrum of, um, our community, even if your parents don't immediately accept you and understand and are able to see what you feel like has been very, very visible for a long time. Um, I hope that this, this helps and this, this can kind of shed some light on the fact that it's, not necessarily their resistance or their refusal to see you as you are and as you want to be seen, but they just remember you as that child that they held and they cradled. And 
there, there's there's no harm or, or, or ill intent in that memory being hard for them to correct. Um, we just have to give them time and grace. And as long as they aren't harmful or malicious, just be patient with them and know that they will come with time because they love you if they're having that fond memory of you as that baby. Um, and so it, it, it was hard and it was shocking. Um, and her, her next response was that I was going against God. And I don't know how much you want me to get into that response, but yeah. How, Actually, how religious were, did you feel personally at that point? So that, you know, when she says something like that, I, I'm kind of trying to get at like, how much, how much did that hit you um, in your faith? So I have for a very long time been, I described myself as agnostic for a long time, um, living as a, as a pretty open lesbian in a smallish kind of, um, I don't know, rural town. They're, they're catching up, but they're still behind in Maryland. Um, and finally just got like, I think our first LGBTQ and trans center in the last like couple of years. So they're moving along, but the very much not so in the past. And so, um, my friends, with, my mom wasn't very religious growing up. She was dragged to Catholic mass at 5 a.m. every Sunday and swore that she would never force religion on me. Uh, funny story, fast forward. So um, in high school, my friends would, I would go to like youth groups and different things with them. I didn't care. I didn't have a devout conviction necessarily. I believed I had, I was baptized. I'd been to everything from Mormon, Episcopalia, Mormon, um, Catholic, all the way. I'd been to Roman Catholic, all of it. Um, wow. And um, most of them, uh, the longer I stayed, the weirder it got and the faster I needed to get the hell out of there. So um, me and religion have had a complicated experience. Um, the, the final straw for me with, I will say, organized religion, because it is not what people believe in that gives them faith. It is, it is the rules that we write down to judge and, and persecute people that, that are the problem in, in organized religion for me specifically um, are... After a specific youth group trip, um, our youth pastor sat us down and had brought in, our youth group leader had sat us down and, and lectured us um, and, and brought in the pastor even to to back her up on how not only was it is it wrong to be gay, but it was wrong to associate with anybody that was gay. And um, I stood up and I said, so if my little brother grows up to be gay, I'm, I'm supposed to disown him. And this woman looked a child dead in her face and said, yes, you are supposed to stop loving your brother if they are gay. So that was my final straw with organized religion. Um, I said some words to that lady I'm sure she had never heard before and stormed out. Um, so uh, this is not really answering your question specifically yet, but uh, so very, very touch and go uh, relationship with organized religion for me, swore it off years ago. Mm -hmm. But I've still always felt some some pull, some, some thing. I, I refer to it as the universe. I believe in something out there that has a greater design for us, but I do also still believe in, in free will. It's a little balancing act between fate and our, and our free will in, in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. So it was more harmful because she had, you know, like I said, fast forward, had become a, a born again Christian in her later life. Her and my stepdad found, found God together and they found a, a small group at church that was really supportive, accepted me. And then my younger sister who has now come out as a, as a lesbian, they fully embraced us and accepted us. And so I was happy for her. And with that, um, so I think that's why it was kind of more weird for me was because I didn't grow up with religion being shoved down my throat. And that wasn't something that, you know, yeah, she taught me to be a good person, leave things better than you found them, treat people like you want to be treated but without the, the fear of the fire and brimstone and someone's going to hurt you if you don't do good things. And so for that to be her, her response was that I'm, I'm going against God. Um, it just, it, it kind of flew in the face of, of other things that she taught me about, you know, just loving and accepting people um, and, and meeting people where they're at. And my response to her was that I completely disagree with you, even if, I said, let's go with this, mom. I said, even if God is responsible for, your God is responsible for what you say, I said, my interpretation of that is that, okay, God sends the soul down to the body and then genetics takes over, man-made affliction takes over, all of the things that we have done to this earth and our bodies and polluted. And I said, there are legitimate birth defects that happen 
that I said, if you believe that that is all God, I said, then you believe that God is the reason that babies are born deformed with holes in their hearts, with different things. We have a, a cousin that was born um, uh, that had a baby that was deformed and it was the most tragic thing in the world. And I could not accept that that would be a choice that a creator would make to just have a soul and a being be born just to have it die within days. I believe that that is something that we have caused on ourselves through all of the things that we've exposed ourselves to through, through millennia. Um, I mean, we see it physically on, on people that are born with birth defects and also with, you know, mental ailments and other um, things that people live with. Why is it so hard to understand that ours might just be internal or at least the, the, you know, the, the, the genetic, like it's, you know, I joke that my, 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 my leg didn't fall off on my X chromosome that it was supposed to. Um, (laughs) That's where I feel like my birth was, that's what I prefer to call it is, is, is if anything, I would be, I would consider this a birth defect. I wasn't born with the appropriate external parts to match my internal being. Hmm. Um, And so I would say that's no different than somebody born with a, a cleft lip or, or other things that you choose whether to adjust it or live with it. And, but that doesn't, make you a demon or an evil person or challenging God. It's, it's so that, that was my response. And she was like, I don't have all the answers for you. I don't know. And I said, well, then why would you put that on me that I'm going against something when you can't verbalize that what it is that I'm even going against? I yeah. said, what if I'm honoring your God by living the true self that he sent down to the, that they sent down to this earth to be. So very, very important. That, that was <laughs> Yeah. It's a really long well answer to that question. No, it was good. And it was very deep. I really did appreciate that. Were there any areas, uh, any other areas of coming out that were particularly challenging for you? Um, no, that was, that was the hardest was my mom mm. for sure. Um, and uh, give another little uh, happy ending story for you all. So up until, so I, trans- I started transitioning in 2015 up even until, Last year, my mom was still calling me Danielle. The other day, and I should probably go grab it because it's sitting in my living room, but the other, yeah, I'm just going to go grab it because this is super exciting. Hold on. The other day, I got this in the mail. Ooh, exciting. I get to see presents. The suspense. Oh, the suspense. Big box. Ooh, big box. Oh. The first time she's ever written my name. That's pretty great. Be patient with your friends and family. They love you and they will come around. It has been almost 10 years, eight years. She's, she's moving. That's a great deal of patience. You know, we talk a lot about on this show that one of the keys to a successful transition is uh, mentally is patience. Yes with yourself, with your body, with the people around you and with your family. And, you know, yeah, I think that that's a a good key takeaway there is that 10 years seems like a very long time, but when you get there, it feels amazing. Yeah, absolutely. What, What are some of the key things that you learned looking back at coming out? Was there, was there anything that you would do differently now or, um, any key takeaways? Um, to be honest, uh, no, I don't, I don't think I would do anything, anything really different. Um, even though there, there was hurdles and obstacles, um, my, the actual physical part of my transition, um, was, so the, I guess the mental acceptance of it, cause I'd been battling it for years was, you know, mostly a relief. Um, and then I started, once I started T, you know, as you're saying the like you, you, you stick the needle in and then you're like, where's my beard? Like, it's like, you're like, uh, cause you've already been waiting for so long that now it's here and you want it. And that's not how anything works. Um, and especially in our, you know, even more so now in our, in our time of instant gratification, it's, it's even more so to get us to be patient. Um, and then, you know, there's, you know, they kept trying to tell me everything from, Oh, everybody's body chemistry is different and this and that. And, You know, so I definitely learned a lot about patience, both, like you said, with myself, of myself, of other people interacting with me. Um, um, Just patience and grace 
is what um, kind of saved me or what I learned and, and what helped me really get through it um, with patience and grace, both with myself and with others. Um, I have, you know, sometimes I have uh, a friend that came out as, as, as transgender and I, I knew them as female before. And even living as a transgender male, I kept saying she. It took me like three months at least to wrap my just my brain and my tongue around that and so living as a transgender person struggling with somebody else's pronouns was like why you know so not not why don't we get it because it's it's like I said once we finally get there we want everything now because in our minds and in what we've been going through internally it's been so long but to everybody else they're like you just got here calm down (laughs) um and we're like no get everything right just it see me um and, and that is, it is really important, especially when we get to experience that, you know, the first time we pass, the first time we get appropriately gendered, um, you know, named and, and all those things. It is really exciting. Um, but yeah, it, it was a patient. So when I first started my testosterone in 2015, I didn't see any physical changes for almost two years. Um, and it was, uh, we had to cycle through, we had, to, had a, a negative reaction to the first testosterone I was on. It was the not that the, the hormone itself, but what it was suspended in, I had an allergic reaction to. I mean, to change that, change my dosage. And so um, patience was was so hard. And, I, and watching people who, you know, started tea a year after me, that this friend that I'm talking about, and they had a beard in three months. And I was like, bro, I'm going to, ah, ah, ah. And I was, year and a half in with nothing. I mean, this now I've, I've now been on T for, for eight years. So I find, and we've got it sorted out now, so it's good, but um, yeah, so definitely it was a huge process in patience. Um, so I would just say that I, I'm glad I got the experience. I would go back and do it again over a hundred percent. I don't regret anything. Um, I would just maybe go, maybe try earlier, but um, I'm just glad that I did it and that, that I had the patience and, and grace to, or was taught the patience and grace to be able to keep going forward. And I'm glad to hear that you, you share that as well. Um, because what I've seen portrayed of our community, and I feel like it's exacerbated or exaggerated when it is showed, but there is this almost built up fear of interacting with transgender people because we're going to explode on you. If you say something wrong, we're just going to start a fight and, and scream and freak out and, so there's this like either walking on eggshells thing or just just avoiding avoiding it completely, um, and I feel like that's just um, counterproductive. Um, and they don't know that. That's not. They're just like, oh, I don't. I don't want to. Ah, that's scary. I don't want to deal with that. Just stay away. Um, yeah. So I'm glad that you're preaching that because I've been or sharing that because I'm encouraging that because I'm trying to as well. Um, when and just as I shared with your audience, um, with you all. It took my mom eight years to get my name right. And what I would say is that it took me almost 30 years to come to terms with everything and figure out who I was and what I wanted to be. We've got to give them at least 30 days, 30 months, right? Like it, give them some kind of equivalent of time to rewire their brain and, and, and work with it. And, you know, like my, my situation paid off. I, I was, as, as Emily and I have both been tonight, but I was very transparent and open and honest with my mom. Um, I drew a hard line in the sand. I said, don't correct my nieces and nephews. Let them call me uncle. Let them call me Danny. They already, they didn't even have to be explained any of that, right? Because kids are smart. They saw me, they knew who and what I was. Um, and I saw her correct them once. And I said, don't do that again. I said, you can call me whatever you want. I will give you all the time in the world that you need to come to terms with that. I said, but don't confuse them because it already makes sense to them. And so that was that that was the the hard line that I did have to draw in the sand for my mom. And yeah. we've both respected that. And um that that was that was me giving her patience and, and grace to to you know let, let her old mind work. <laughs> well, and that's a key point that you bring out too, that um, you know, it takes us so long to come to grips with being trans because we fight it so much ourselves that right. when we hit that point of like, okay, I'm ready to accept this. Um, we've already gone through so much to get to that point that now we're ready and now we're ready to go to a hundred. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's not outwardly, it, it hasn't built up like that for everybody else. And so 
Yeah. Right. It, it, it takes them time. It's just, it's just the unfortunate aspect of learning to accept yourself to be able to come out that is such a long, drawn-out process that <laughs> by the time we're there, we're ready for everything and for everyone yeah. to accept us, and it's just unrealistic. Yeah. Absolutely. But, and that's, that's exactly it. Like we said, I want, I wanted my beard. I wanted my body shape to change. I wanted my name. I wanted everything right now. Give it to me. And, um, (laughs) that's not not how anything works. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you've got this excitement. You've, you've come out, you've got the excitement. You're, you're starting on tea and things like that. I'm sure you're starting to feel more like yourself and kind of better about yourself. But at that point, what were the fears that, um, that were, were hitting you? Um, My therapist, the first step um, before, I think the first, one of the first things that, that my therapist had me do was, um, I love him, he's a cute little gay man named Sage, he's phenomenal. Um, he was like, okay, so uh, I need you to start using the male restroom. No, <laughs> no, that's the place I'm terrified of. Yeah. No, not happening. Um so that that was that was definitely the the biggest both physical and mental challenge for me and like i said i still eight years later i still struggle with it it's better you know i might i might you know flinch for a second but then i just i just go about my business um and it, but it's, it took me a long time to get there mm-hmm. um in and when i was going to college um in 2015 when i was so i was i was in college while i was transitioning just funny because you know it's not the oh I'm I'm in my 20s experimenting going to college I'm in my 30s but I was still doing some stuff right so it's kind of interesting it's still lined up um, definitely still you know obviously now I'm going through all different kinds of hormonal changes puberty round two which people don't really talk about that it's really it's just puberty round two I mean I don't know about you I had so much acne it was so bad. Uh, and so many other things, but I was just like, what is wrong? And I was just like, oh, this is what I wanted. Luckily, I've, I've heard that, yeah, that's, that's a going towards testosterone thing, the acne. Um, our skin clears up and gets very soft. It's, it's kind of wonderful. <laughs> um, okay, I, I will take that. I will take that on. So um, staying in the restroom thing for a second, um, as someone who's in, uh, you know, is, is being politically active, I was just kind of curious about this. Um, as someone who's polit- politically active, that's less less of a part of it, honestly. But as someone who considers themselves binary, you know, you and I both, uh, we've talked about this, that we both identify as binary trans. I'm female, mm-hmm. you're male. Yeah. I was kind of curious what your take is on restrooms. Uh, do you feel like a gender neutral restroom is is the way to go? Or do you feel a lot of satisfaction as as I do personally, being able to use the, the restroom assigned to that gender that you were never able to before? Sure. And I'm going to give an answer that I've been starting to give to a lot of questions that is annoying some people. But I think it's a both and. I think that um, in a lot of aspects of, of our life, uh, culture, society, and politics, we do ourselves a disservice by going to certain absolutes. And, and not in, in how we feel as, as, as in our binary, but that we should go to all only gender neutral bathrooms or stay strictly male and female bathrooms. Um, there are, in most places, so I guess this would only be really be a problem for smaller establishments that might only have two restroom doors, right? They can't, they don't have a third one, but for places like college campuses, malls, places that already have a variety of bathrooms built in, I don't see why there can't be a male bathroom, a female bathroom and a gender neutral bathroom. And then that way, if, you know, I don't, because while I have a fear about walking into a bathroom, I also don't want to, even though a lot of their reasoning is garbage, I also don't want to diminish diminish a straight person's or cis person's concern about possibly going into a bathroom with someone whose gender they are unsure of. Just as we want to be respected in our safety, we should, as long as they're not harming us, okay, fine. You want to just go into a male bathroom, fine. So I can I can understand how if we tried to go in, in all extremes in one way or another, nobody's happy. But I feel like why, we can we can literally make everyone happy by there's a male bathroom, there's a female bathroom, 
there's a gender neutral bathroom. We've already started even before the whole gendered bathroom discussion came up. I was already amazed years ago by seeing family bathrooms. So this, this thing that it's new, like we've already been shifting to a place where we see that there needs to be a place for people of either both and every in between to have a place to go because just having a male bathroom as a single dad with a three-year-old little girl, you don't want to take them into a male bathroom, but yeah. you can't go into a female bathroom. Yeah. And so that's the, the, the opposite side of it that people don't think about is, is having a gender neutral or a family bathroom isn't just placating Dutch crazy trans people wanting to change the world. It's, it would actually benefit a lot of people. You know, it, it's not as big of a deal for, you know, a mom, um, a mom taking a, a little boy into a female bathroom. But I've, I've verbally heard it said by comedians and people I know that they do not want to take their little girl into a male bathroom because even if nothing negative happens, there's still urinals, right? Like, so th there's still the chance that they might see or be exposed to something that they are not quite prepared for, even if it's not intentionally harmful or negative. And so I feel like we need to throttle back the extremist speak in the language that if we go into these bathrooms, we're either going to be raped or scarred for life and all of this terrible thing. And just be honest that, hey, uh, that makes me uncomfortable and I'd rather have my own space. Because really, that's what we're asking for as well. And so we could and, and that and that's where I, I so I <clears throat> and not to judge anybody's beliefs or, or whatnot, but that that's what I found is. And not that I'm trying to walk the middle and make everybody happy. That's just what makes sense to me is that going one extreme or the other excludes a group of people when both are asking to be included. So why would you, you know, if, if, and. Uh, when both are side. asking to be included and the concern is safety. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we, we just all just need to start being more honest. We're like, look, uh, it makes me uncomfortable. Okay. You go put your penis in that urinal over there and I'm going to go over to this gentle neutral bathroom and be safe. Right. Like, so, but there, there is also, um, once I got more over it and more comfortable walking into the bathroom, there was even, like I said, there's this fear and then yes, like it's a, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so, so yeah, there, there, there is that. And so I, I, I don't think going in, in, exclusively one way or the other is, is the answer. And, you know, maybe for places that only have one bathroom or two bathrooms that, you know, their best solution would just to be to go gender neutral. But for places that have dozens, you know, of, of bathrooms, facilities spread across either a campus or a business or something like that, split them up, whatever. Yeah. Do you, um, do you have a particular memory of when, um, cause I, I do from early in my transition, when I finally got to a point where being in a women's section or even being in a women's restroom where I thought like, okay, I'm not in a women's restroom. I'm in or in, in a women's section, I'm in my section. And I, right. and I was finally able to own it as mine. Did you, do you have a particular memory of that? Um, no, I think mine was more, um, I mean, I do, I do, you know, there's, there's, I definitely, you know, have experienced that as well. The, the shift from, and you know, it's funny, I guess mine was more child to adult, which is weird to say as, as now the, I was 30 at the time and now 37. I kept referring to myself as a boy. Like, like I'm a boy, like I'm a boy. And just first of all, because male just doesn't necessarily fit in all like, you know, proper in speaking and not that properly speaking right now, but so I would just, yeah, I'm a boy and you know, I'm a boy. That's a girl, you know, it, it, uh, man, whoop, like, I don't know. So, and when somebody would say something about man or my wife would be like, no, you're, you're a man. You're not a boy. And I'd be like, Ooh, <laughs> like I just, and, and part of it was probably because I was still going through my, my second puberty and, and, you know, I didn't have the facial hair. So even if I did pass, it was as like a 15 year old, you know, young boy. So I think mine was more when, I started actually feeling like an adult male, like, yeah, I'm a grown up. <laughs> like, I, can, I, I can, I can go do all these responsible things. And I don't know, I had already served my country. So I guess yeah. not that I wasn't responsible things, but th that, that, I think that was my harder, harder 
uh, acceptance for me was like, because I didn't feel like I'm, I had wanted to for so long, but I just still didn't feel like a man. Yeah. Now I do. No, I totally get that. And that's, that, that gets to the, um, the heart of what the question was, essentially, anyways. Um, I'm going to jump over to our more sort of ethereal question uh, of the bunch sure. here. And that is, what does transition look like to you? What does it mean to you to transition? Um, I would say to... For me, it was making my outside match my inside. And I know for some people it's it's different. It's uh like you know, especially for not non-binary people, it's more the the freedom of from being restricted into one or the other. Um but um yeah, for me that was that was um the hold on, I just got kind of lost. Ask me your question again. <laughs> I went deep into my head. Ask me your question again, please. <laughs> I just basically, like I said, what, what does transition look like to you and uh, how does it, what does it mean there to you go. as, as a concept? Yeah. Okay. So thank you. So as, as, as a concept, it's, it's our realization, our manifestation of what we've, we've always felt internally, but didn't know how to express or manifest, um, and so, and, and I, I kind of like that, not only for me, but, but for others, because um, there's some, and it, just like I was talking about the, the, the extreme or the absolute cutoff to where, you know, I, I, I heard people talk in, in certain communities that like, oh, well, if you don't, if you're not on hormones and do top and bottom surgery, then you're not really, you know, you haven't fully transitioned. And, yeah. and so I, just, I, I don't, I don't like that. Um, so for me, I would just say, and, and what I hope that, that others can take from that is, is transitioning is just manifesting whatever you already feel, making it real, making it tangible, um, becoming our true selves. Like I'm, I'm really glad that we've changed and moved away from transsexual and, um, the sex change and, and, and things like that, because it's, it's not a sex change. It's, it's an affirmation. It's, it's a realization of the sex that we were always supposed to be. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so transitioning to me is, is taking yourself to whatever place you need to be to reach your true self and, and, and maximum happiness. Wonderful. So um, as you were moving along in your journey, have your goals shifted? Um, did you, when you set out on your gender journey, did you have something in mind that like a, some, some people actually set out a schedule and there's a checklist of things to do. Did you do anything like that? And um, as, as you've moved along, have things that were not on the table suddenly seemed interesting to you or things that you thought you needed to feel like yourself have kind of fallen away? Um, that's a good question. I would say that, hmm, hit me one more time. You got me deep in thought over here. <laughs> what is it that, you're, that you're, you're thinking deeply about? Maybe we should talk directly about that if there's something else. Um, no, it's just, it's just, um, yeah, like I'm, I'm going deep into the, into the, into the ethers to, to pull this out. Um, yeah, I would, the, the essence of this question so is just, apologize. you know, as, as you looked towards transition, did you think, oh, right. and, and, and as you were defining transition for yourself early on, were there certain steps and certain things that needed right. to be included in transition that as you actually got into it and moved along were, were, were less important or more important? Yes. So, um, initially, like I said, um, I, I had already limited myself before I even let myself fully decide that I wanted to transition. I was like, I'm only going to do this, or I'm only going to do this. Um, so I went kind of the opposite at first. I went from, I was only going to maybe have a hysterectomy and then well, maybe I was only going to have a mastectomy. Um, and to when I let myself fully embrace, I was like, 
we're going, let's do this. I was like, I want therapy. I want hormones. I want surgery. Let's go. Um, and so my, uh, again, just like we were talking, my was urgency. I wanted everything now. I wanted a beard right away. Um, <clears throat> I got very, uh, again, very fortunate that because I was um, already 30 years old, I was already what my doctor, both my therapist and my you know, physician described as male presenting in my life already in the way I lived. Um, I didn't have to do the one year waiting period to even start my hormones. I think I saw my doctor, I was in therapy for about three to six months. And then I saw my doctor for testosterone. And I think I started testosterone like a month later, not even, um, and then um, I was like, I want my name changed. I want my surgeries, this. And then so it was, it was a, it was a balancing act because they kept telling me to, you know, you know, the, the patients, the weight, the, the getting all that. So um, I would say the the most important and the thing that I was most excited about was my hysterectomy. Hmm. So that was that was definitely a huge a huge checkbox for me. And then my top surgery. Um, and then my beard, those were, those were the three things that I was, I was most excited about, um, losing the female anatomy that didn't, that wasn't supposed to be there anyway. And then gaining, gaining this little guy right here. Um, the, the full disclosure, I have not had bottom surgery. Um, so that's one that I would say, uh, has bounced back on and off the table at times, um, I mean, you and I are fortunate that right now the, the surgeries are as good as they are, but there's still, especially with the, 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 the lower regions, those ones, um, at least on my end, still have a lot of, a lot of work of work to go. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to make something stand up. That's not there, right? Like, so, uh, um, there's, there's some, there's some wonderful things that they've done with, with implants and, and, and stuff. But, um, so I would say that that one, that one has come on the table and off the table and, and I'm pretty sure for for the most part, it's going to stay off the table mm -hmm. for me. So we talked about your fears going into transition. As you've gone through, what were some of the hurdles that you ran into and how did you get over those? Um, not, not, tra not physically transitioning for about two years was, was my hurdle was in, in that um, because I wanted to pass so bad and it was funny to me because I passed even before I started transitioning, you know, when I was younger, like I said, and I, and I wouldn't correct people when they would, you know, call me a, a boy or call me sir when I was uh, a teenager. Um, but so like now as a 30 year old, where I'd like specifically cut my hair and was specifically wearing boy clothes and male clothes and wanted to be male. Um, when I got misgendered, I would get really pissed, but not, not in a way that I, I would say anything. But then that was funny because then me and my wife would end up in a little tiff because like I was upset and she's like, well, you should have said something. And I was like, no, I wasn't ready to say anything. Um, <laughs> so then, you know, there's, there's that as well. Um, but um, so, yeah, so, so for me, that, that was my biggest hurdle was being so desperate to just pass and be a male already. It was like, okay, I've waited 30 years and then now I'm on testosterone how much longer do I have to wait? <laughs> uh, um, but I'm, I'm so glad that I hung in there. My doctor was super awesome. And we, we kept tweaking my, my testosterone dosage. Um, actually, if I can add a little side note right there, if anybody is having issues pushing their, their transition along as, as a male, what I found, and I don't know if this is common, or this obviously isn't common because my doctor was like, Oh, whoa, all right, let's try that. Um, and I found out about this in a roundabout way, but I suggested to my doctor because my numbers were spiking. Like my, when we did my labs, we could see that the, the testosterone, the, my, the, what I was taking was increasing my testosterone levels in my body, but it wasn't staying. And so what we ended up doing was instead of doing a high dose once a week, we cut it in half and I do two doses a lower dose twice a week so that, cause what I was doing was it was spiking and then dropping. Like my body was just, it wasn't, it wasn't able to. So now I have, instead of doing those huge peaks and, and valleys, like as I'm starting to come down three days later, I, so I, I do mine every, every three days. Mm -hmm. um, and that 
changed everything. I Within two months of doing that, facial hair started coming in. Everything just absolutely took off. Um, so it's not necessarily about putting more testosterone in your body in one shot because our bodies can only absorb, process, and use so much. Um, and, and every time we go too high, our body releases estrogen to balance it out. So it's, and I'm sure anybody who's on any type of hormones right now has, has experienced that at least a little bit that our, our biological system is, is very much a balancing act. Um, but so yeah, it's not necessarily about cramming more faster. So I actually had to take less, but twice a week. And so that was, that was actually what, what, what I took off, what took off after that. And now my dog's whining. <laughs> Hello. So um, you mentioned before that you were struggling a little bit with the, the deep questions. We've got three questions remaining here, and they're pretty yeah, deep. So, so, so get ready for this. <laughs> All right. I'm good. I'm ready. Okay. First off, um, what do you feel you've been able to accomplish because of your transition? Um, changing some hearts and minds. Um, because of some things that I've learned and grown and, um, fully embraced myself with this. It's, and like you said earlier, it's, it's, it's crazy. The, um, little bit like the, the confidence boost that we get from such little things in our transition process. It's like, I didn't even know that I could feel this good. Like what? Um, and, uh, so, um, yeah, mo moving along as that, it felt really good. Um, when I was embraced and able to have conversations with people that might not have given somebody else the time of day. Um, and so some of it is because it might've been friend or similar acquaintance. And for a variety of reasons, um, <clears throat> when I'm given the opportunity to, to break through and, and I'm able to um, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. And so I think that <clears throat> the patience that I had to exhibit with myself in my, in my two year process of having no changes happening, the, the, the patience with, with my mom and, and my family who were, were struggling to adjust, um, being able to give that same patience to, and I guess kind of almost like remembering that the, this, this stranger that I'm talking to or whoever it is, you know, I can give them the same patience and grace that I was giving my mom. And again, not to an extent to where anybody's harmful or malicious or being disrespectful to you, but if they're in dialogue, if they're trying to learn and they're just, you know, not there yet, then, then they deserve that patience because they're trying and they, and they want to learn. Um, and so that, that has been, I think my favorite part um, is using what is now my cis white male appearance um, to break into places where some transgender people might not necessarily be able to get to and having these conversations mm. that might not have been brought up or had and actually being able to see people, you know, even, even if they don't immediately jump to, to our side or completely embrace us, just, giving them something to think about to where, you know, I don't know, there's, there's a potential there instead of getting in a fight and having somebody walk away saying, yeah, I knew I hated trans people. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what we wanted. I think you sort of answered um, in that what your, the favorite thing that you've learned on your journey. Is there something else that you'd like to add to that? Um. <clears throat> I definitely have learned that none of us are perfect. None of us knows everything. And uh, we all just need love and acceptance, no matter who we are, where we are. Um, and oftentimes, someone that may be coming at us with hurt and or with, with, um, with violence or, or anger um, or ignorance is most of it, um, 
sometimes they're coming from a place of hurt and and fear and not not excusing any negative behavior in any way shape or form but um learning that's that that sometimes it, it came from some bad stuff that had happened to them as well and you know, it's, it's not always easy, especially if somebody is, is screaming in your face or, um, being disrespectful or insulting. Um, but a lot of times they just need love and acceptance too, um, and haven't gotten it and don't know how to, to show it. Um, and, uh, I'm not perfect. I got, I got into a little something with somebody earlier today, not about trans, not about anything trans, but um, just just to show that you know, um, it, just like I'm saying, I'm, I'm not perfect either. Even in all that we've talked about tonight, in my in my patience and, and trying to be patient and graceful with everybody, um, it doesn't always happen. Um, but yeah, I, I and somebody shared with me that they think that, um, like I don't know, as, as, as some people are, are demonizing us and, and trying to other us, and you know, in, in some ways, my my some some people are like you all are like kind of the next evolution. Like we have to go through and do so much self-reflection and soul searching and risk taking and just believing in, in something and, and not giving up um, in the face of so much adversity and uncertainty. Um, I kind of laughed and I was like, I don't know if, I don't know if we could, we could take that, but I just, it, it was an interesting point that, that what they shared with me was that many transgender people that they meet are much more open, loving, and accepting because of what we've been through to heal our own selves. And again, we're not perfect. There are people in our community that are assholes um, mm-hmm. and mistreat other people. Um, but um, yeah, and, I, and, and there it is even more the proof. I've met some really dickhead transgender people um, but that, so that's, that's not a community. That's, that's a person. Um, but so there's, there's assholes in all communities. Um, but at the end of the day, most of it boils down to they've been hurt, um, misled, um, fed ignorance. And, um, we're all just human at the end of the day and want to be loved and just, just trying to embody and, and embrace and, and share that because I know so many of us feel so lost and alone and, hopeless a lot of times and that, you know, we're going through this struggle alone. Um, and that's what I would say. One, another most exciting thing was when I met my other first transgender person, um, because I'd only seen these people online, even the, even the, the, the mentor, I feel like I, I looked up to, um, I had never met one in person. So that was really exciting when I was like, Ooh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> yeah. We like to do that, do that too. My girlfriend and I, Oh, look at trans. Which I, um, you know, uh, there was a whole conversation about uh, that terminology, but um, <laughs> it's, I, always, it's always fun when you meet another trans person. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I embrace trans. I, I don't, I don't think it's a dirty word. I don't think we should shy away from it. Um, you know, there, there is some derogatory things that have been, have been lobbed at us over the decades, but um, I don't, I don't take transgender as anything negative. I, I wholly embrace and and announce it in my speeches. I am a transgender male. Until they see us, they hear us, they know that we are just as human as them. And then the fear is not going to stop. Yeah. That's the only way to stop the fear. So with all you've learned and what you've been through, what advice do you have to pass on to younger closeted trans folks out there? Don't give up. You are not crazy. (laughs) You are not wrong. And there's nothing wrong with you. Um, some things might have not gone as the way they were supposed to as you were developing. But that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. Um, there is a place for you. There are people who love, support, and celebrate your existence. And seek them out. Even um, there are going to be hard times. There's, there's going to be hard times. There's no way to lie and say that um, your transition is going to be sunshine and rainbows. But I hope that you find that most days. And uh, don't give up on, on the cloudy days. It's okay to take refuge and, and go inside and um, not, not be out in the world when you need to be. And uh, when you're ready to be you, we're, we're ready to embrace you and, and love and support you.
it does get better. I know that that can sometimes sound cheesy, but um, I think that's not only some of the other amazing transgender people that we have all over the world right now doing amazing things. Um, if you know no one else, Emily and I are, are sitting here living proof that it does get better. Don't give up. We love you. Beautiful advice and wonderful words. I think that's that's great for everybody to remember. It definitely it definitely does get better. Shy asks, uh, "How old were you when you got married?" And then wanted to dive into your experience with coming out to her. And um, yeah, like I said, I, I guess I kind of glossed over that too much. I know that we've talked about that story a little bit, so maybe maybe I just know it too well. But how old were you when you got married? And what was the experience like for you? How did you approach coming out to her? Yeah, so um, um, I, I keep saying this, and I, <laughs> I, get, I just, I am, I've been very fortunate. So when I met my wife, I met my wife in 2012. <clears throat> um, funny story, we met at, on St. Patrick's Day, at a bar in Ventura called Patty's. So um, <clears throat> we met in uh, 2012. Uh, got married two years later in 2014. Um, interestingly enough, when I met her, um, I did not believe, and, and we started dating, I did not believe that she was uh, gay or lesbian. I thought that, I don't know, just, uh, you know, I don't know. It happens sometimes where a straight girl's interested in you, right? So I just, I didn't, I didn't really think anything of it. I didn't know that, um, you know, if she had been with anybody because she was there with, with her mom and her, their best friend who, who was a gay woman. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, so I thought that like, I was, um, the first one that had been with her. I found out later she had had, uh, curiosities before, but never, um, like really did anything. Mm -hmm. Um, but so when she came out to, to her friends and they just let her know that, that she was dating me. Um, and I even had one of my friends that were like, Oh, so, so she's a lesbian. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. She's just, she just likes me. We're just in her, she was like, but she's with you. So she has to be a lesbian. And I was like, no, she doesn't. Um, and again, that's that need to, to label it and, and box people in. Um, and uh, so we kind of joked that my wife was the the perfect person for me because we, before we really knew how to formally, and obviously for a variety of reasons, she's my wife, but um, in the sense that she's the embodiment of a person that I've been actually talking about for a very long time where I've said for a very long time, and, and people would always push back on this, I said that I believe that one day there will be more gay people than there are straight people. And not in a sense that everyone will be in same-sex couple. And this is this was my answer when they would push back, but not in the sense that everyone will be in a same-sex couple, but that in the sense that, and this was me looking at our generation as millennials being more open, loving, and accepting, and embracing of people and then we see the Zoomers are even more so and, and more so in the younger generations. I said, there's going to be just so many more of us that don't care or need to be forced to be heterosexual because, and, and we've seen that in our trend, they say that, you know, Oh, homosexuality was like this huge, crazy trend that came out of nowhere in the nineties. But if you look at it historically, it's always been there the surge is when we were allowed to finally step out of the darkness. And as we allow, were allowed to share more, more people became, and that's what they're saying. They made this, they're making the same argument right now with transgender and two spirit people that it's this crazy fad that people are just jumping on. And, right. but no, I'm, I'm uh, a wonderful podcaster that I watch. Uh, David Dole puts this wonderful graph up and shows to disprove their stupid argument that, um, it shows left-handedness in, in the, in the United States. And there's this peak and it drops from like the 1930s all the way up to like the sixties. And then you see this huge spike in people um, reporting that they're left-handed. You know why? The nuns stopped beating it out of them. They were no longer told you're wrong if you're left-handed. So people just started to be allowed to be themselves. So it looks like there's this huge surge, but then it plateaus at about 12% as far as the left-handedness goes. Um, so that was my argument that not only are we shifting as a society, but that as we become more open, loving, and accepting, it's going to matter less. And a perfect song lyric that has always embodied this for me is calling back my lesbian days, Ani DeFranco. Um, 
where she says, I don't care about sex or race. I just want to hear your voice. I just want to see your face. Hmm. And I, that's, that's my wife. My wife just loves people. And so the specific genitalia expression ex- ex- existence didn't, didn't necessarily matter. And now that's not to say that it wasn't still hard for her and there hasn't been some difficult times, but going from dating men to being with me as a, as a female and then me wanting to be a male, the, <laughs> the funniest part was her when she went and told her friends that I was, I wanted to transition her one redheaded friend that gave her shit when she came out as being a lesbian or told her that she was dating me. She didn't come out as lesbian. Um, she was like, will you just make up your mind already? We <laughs> um, so got uh, together in 2012, married in 2014. It was in 2015 when I started transitioning. So very early in both our relationship and, and our marriage um, to be springing something like that on someone. Um, and she was just amazing. Um, and like I uh, mentioned earlier, she was put more, more pushy um, for me to, to disclose, bless you, um, than I was. She was more pushy for me to disclose um, and correct people than I was. Um, so all supported, but we, we have had talks that um, I would say, you know, to give you a specific answer, uh, Brianna, to your question, uh, one of the hardest parts for my wife was um, losing my chest. Um, she actually liked having boobs um, there to, to play with. But what's interesting is that because I was never comfortable or happy with my chest, she didn't get to touch it anyway. Even when we were intimate, I always had on a sports bra. I was never comfortable with them. And so, you know, while sometimes she feels sad and, 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 you know, looks at my chest and, and sees that there's something gone now, when we're intimate, um, she's able to touch my chest and I enjoy her putting her hands on my chest and, and being, you know, putting her head here and, and laying with me. Um, so even in sometimes with the, with this, the, the things that were hard or are, are sad in the moment. Um, another thing that, that I've learned is it's okay for people to be sad about us changing. It's okay for them to grieve the loss of something that is different. Um, and that doesn't mean that they don't love or respect or accept you. Um, my wife still absolutely loves me. Um, and it, I used to get really upset when she would get sad, not mad at her, but I would start to feel guilty that I had taken something from her or that I was robbing her of something and that I was making her sad and felt like she didn't really have a choice. I mean, even though we discussed it, I, I can't imagine she would have said, no, you can't do this, you know? So even though we had a discussion um, and I, I've been, you know, open and, and with her about everything, there still really wasn't much of a choice in it for her. Um, and so there have been times that I felt really guilty about that. And, you know, she said, no, you've got to let me be sad. I'll be okay. Um, just let me feel, you know, feel through it. Um so, you know, if any, any, any trans people or, or people who are partners with trans people are, are experiencing that, um, just like earlier, love, love, patience and grace, um, let them be sad and grieve. It's doesn't mean that, that, that they, they don't love you or that they're unhappy with what's happening, but just like it is for us, it's, it's a process. Mm-hmm. Um, some of us, you know, bury, you know, female clothes or, 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 you know, you know, burn our old name tags and, and things like that. There's, there's a process for all of us. And, and so just like that, I, I had to let her work through her own, her own grieving process of, and, you know, sometimes it still hits. She'll see a picture of us, like from when we got married, I still, you know, presented um, even with my short hair, very, very female. And so she'll see that sometimes and, and get teary eyed. And she says, who was that? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. This is some chick. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> Basically. It's funny. That was another thing that I, I um, am very happy to be at a place to look back at old photos and, um, you know, feel feel nothing but neutral. Well, I, you know, kind of a, a pride and, and, and happiness for the person that was that's in those photos. I was, you know, people are posting this 10 year challenge and I went and I found I a 10 year old photo. And, um, you know, I was with with good friends at one of my favorite places so um you know uh, there's a, a photo of a, of a dude there with a, a big happy smile on his face and it's like i don't 
I don't regret any of that. I don't fault any of that. And it's just nice to be able to look back at those photos and go, hey, that was that was a time. It's a very yeah. different time. But yeah. when you can get to that place where, you know, you can accept even who you were before you came to accept yourself. I think it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I actually, I have a question for you as we're talking about looking into our past. Okay. This is something I go back and forth on. When you are talking about your past self, how do you gender it? The story? Well, it depends on how much I I decide to detach myself from it. You know, a lot of the stuff, um, when I'm talking about it, I will talk about, you know, first person, me, I went and did this, me and my, my ex. Um, I was married. I was with my ex for the better part of 12 years. So a, a, a giant portion of my adult life was with this one person. And so it's all in that, in that framework, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm able to kind of talk about it without, without gender really. And okay. or to, th to think about gender, um, you know, it, it was me. It's when I'm looking at photos and in situations that it's like, oh, you know, yeah, he was, he was a fun guy. <laughs> he was having a good time there. Um, but yeah, just yeah. Generally, I just kind of think of myself in the in the first person, and and don't detach anything before acceptance. Um, it's I appreciate being able to look back at the photos and see a different person than I am today. Mm. It, you know, just um, very very visibly different um, because I can. Wow. Um, it's because I can detach myself from that pain and the struggle and hurt that I went through before I accepted myself. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Don't usually let the, the, the guests turn it around on me, but I'm always happy to talk about myself. So, Hey, um, there are a lot of folks talking in chat about, um, even until, the, even into the seventies being told that they, um, they weren't, they shouldn't write left-handed and being forced to, to write right-handed and adapted. Yeah. And so like they, they, as a kid trying to use the wrong hand, you hold the pencil wrong and it just becomes a thing. And so you, you, you do it your whole life that way. Um, yeah. I'm actually glad that people are responding to that because that's, that's it. Trans people have always been here. Gay people have always been here. We were just so marginalized, abused, and excluded that we were afraid to show our face, literally. And so you just didn't hear about it. So, I mean, I was amazed to find out that we had somebody, um, I believe they made it to a, at least a lower level of political office um, before transgender people were really out in public and they, they had been able to transition mostly in stealth. And so just a, appeared in the world as, as a female and, 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 and ran for office and, and was um, uh, outed uh, within, I think within a few weeks and, and had to step down. Um, but so we've always been, we've always been here. This isn't some crazy fad. We're just no longer so terrified that we're, we're staying hidden in the shadows. We're, we're demanding to be seen and be heard and, and be recognized as, as human. So we, I mentioned that we do Transistence, the new show on Monday, and we talk about things, and it, it's getting a little repetitive because um, people are trying the same BS over and over again, the same types of, of laws to limit um, limit rights uh, for, yeah. for uh, trans people specifically, trans women a lot of the time specifically. Yes. Um, oh, why am I losing my thought? I, it was so clear. I infected uh, you. <laughs> um. It keeps hitting the tip of my tongue and then and then fleeting away as soon as it gets there. Um, what what were you just saying? Do you remember so that I can bounce off that again? Yes, um, we were talking about how um, now that we were out, able to come out of the darkness and and live and be ourselves, um, there's a lot more of us. Oh, um, but it's not. Yeah. Um, what have you run into much as you're beginning your uh, political aspirations, where? Um, We've seen a lot of fear of indoctrination uh, into being trans and LGBT. Uh, we're talking about stories on transistence of um, superintendents, principals, things like that. 
talking about burning books that yeah. it's funny that, that they include critical race theory, um, but also, you know, anything LGBT and trans because of this fear of indoctrination. Um, what have been some of your early thoughts on that? And, and have you had a chance to really kind of articulate anything? And if so, like, how do you approach those? Yeah, I actually haven't um, gotten those hard questions yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm preparing for them and, and trying to figure out the best way to move forward with that because what's, what's extremely interesting to me is that it's always the people screaming about, like in this specific example, the people screaming about, we don't want our kids indoctrinated while they are indoctrinating their children by refusing to teach them certain things, right? They, if they're, and so um, just like the anti-vaxxers, anti-maskers screaming, my body, my choice, while then turning around and denying a woman their right to choose with abortion, denying transgender people access to medical care. Um, and so that's what's been really frustrating for me is that they don't even really mean, understand, or believe what they're saying. Um, it's just this fear frenzy that's been whipped up, and we are the most recent other we're we're the new we're the new scapegoat um trans people are poisoning everybody they're gonna touch your kids and turn them trans and like that was that was the thing in the 80s and 90s because one of, i was just telling somebody yesterday one of my best friends the best friend that i came out to um that i confided in that i thought i was a lesbian um her mom told her that they were raised southern baptist and her mom told her that if she kept hanging out with me that it was wrong that I was gay. And if she kept hanging out with me, she was going to become gay too. And so uh, my friend told everybody at school that I was gay so that I would figure out it was wrong and change um, because they, they just, they, they don't even understand how anything works. Mm -hmm. This That's my biggest problem is the people screaming the loudest about all this garbage uh, or making up all of this garbage and the, these problems that aren't real. It's a distraction. And it's so often, absolute utter bullshit just absolute garbage um again perfect example there's uh, a clip of i don't remember where he's from it's either texas or virginia maybe it's florida one of those three states putting up a law dude's talking about how you can't talk about critical race theory we can't be teaching kids that they're evil and that that american history is bad and all of this stuff but we have to teach an honest, open, objective history about fascism, Nazism, and without any bias. You can't, we have to, we have to show both sides. Well, but that's what the whole critical race theory is. Like, and it's not even being taught anywhere below college. And all of these fights, these parents, the politicians, the boards of education that are screaming about this stuff are all grade school level. This is at the very least, and specifically critical race theory, but with the trans indoctrination thing as well. When they're teaching gender studies, when, when we're having these deep dialogues and conversations about what does gender mean and the social constructs behind everything from, you know, the, the colors of pens that you buy and everything, right? Those are all college level courses where people are above the age of 18. They're old enough to vote, drive, join the military, do all of these things, but they're too immature, incapable, and infantile to have a discussion about race. Like what? So that my biggest problems with this is that they're not even having a real conversation about if it was an issue, the issue. And then they're screaming about needing to teach everything about these awful parts of somebody else's history, but they won't let us teach our awful parts of our history. And it just, I, I, just, I don't understand. 
I think that until we get to a place or we need to keep pushing to get to a place where we can have these honest conversations without it turning into attacks. Um, and, you know, just like you and I are doing, and not that we necessarily have, you know, are far opposite ends of the spectrum or disagree on a lot, but I feel like you and I try and connect with other people who might not necessarily agree with us and mm-hmm. have those conversations because if we just stay in our bubble, we just stay insulated and we think that everything, either everybody agrees with us or everything is fine and everybody else sucks. Um, but until we go out and have those conversations with people who don't agree with us, who might be afraid of us, um, who might not understand, those people aren't going to seek out that knowledge on their own. Somebody who thinks that we shouldn't exist, somebody who thinks that we don't deserve to have rights, somebody who thinks that we're an abomination, isn't going to go try and educate themselves on a trans person's experience. Correct. So, and when, you know, oh, just let them go figure it out or telling somebody to Google it. No, because they're going to Google the wrong stuff. Number one. Number two. Ah, uh, no, just no. Just um, no. So what, what, what's your plan in that? I mean, I know we have, we've, we talked um, a lot about the recent redistricting in, um, in our area to make our area, uh, our county red, because there are red uh there are red areas here red um i don't know i don't know what the the, the sub uh what the sub breakdown of the, of the county is cities. but there's, there's definitely red cities here yeah um so i i have a feeling that you will kind of run into that that willful um avoidance of education yeah. the pushback against education for some reason and that pushback against f- facts <laughs> Do you have any kind of plan? Have you talked to anybody or learned a way to reach people and educate them when they have such a strong hesitancy? Sure. Um, What I would say is my uh, experience and the way I've been uh, interacting with people since I was a lesbian, um, I've always done the same thing that I was sharing with you earlier. It's like, no matter how ignorant somebody is asking me a question I've always tried to take the time to sit down and answer it as much as it might annoy or insult me. Um, if they are honestly seeking knowledge, no matter how disrespectfully formed, I try to answer it. So I will continue going forward in that, in that aspect. Um, if somebody is yelling something at me, I'm going to engage right back and hopefully, you know, um, get past that point. Um, as far as on a political and a policy standpoint, Again, we're really fortunate that here in California, we're not having that same critical race theory fight. And um, while we don't have a huge transgender community and there are some red pockets, um, the district that I'm running in, that, that we live in, is has the least, out of the whole county, has the least of the red pockets. Um, but there, there, are, there are still some. And I'm even surprised when um, I'm, you know, trying to talk to people about, you know, the, these policies here behind me and, you know, they're like, oh, well, I, I don't really think we should have healthcare for all. And I'm like, what? You live right here in California? And <laughs> you don't think like, um, so it is still shocking to me that we do have some of the more conservative holdouts here that are, um, uh, and not that I have a problem with, with conservative people, but I, I don't understand the voting against your own interest and, fighting policies that are in your own good because you've been, you've been sold a bill of goods <clears throat> and that's really what it boils down to. So the, the fights that are happening around is specifically critical race theory and, and trans indoctrination. <clears throat> Both Republicans and Democrats are fumbling terribly when responding to those questions. Um, a specific instance, the, the VA governor's race that blew everybody's mind when um, Terry McAuliffe lost to Glenn Youngkin um, and a lot of people are talking about that it was critical race theory that decided that VA governor's race. Um, and yes, that was talked about, but it wasn't specifically critical race theory. It was the candidates' responses to the questions about critical race theory, where the Democrat Terry McAuliffe said, um, "Parents don't belong in the classrooms. Get out of here! Like you're not. You're, we're just going to do what we're going to do." Um, and while I don't agree with burning books and and that level of say. You also can't look at a parent and tell them they have no say on what 
happens to your child in a classroom. Um, so again, th th there's a balance. And so, you know, the Democrats just consistently fail on messaging and on responding. Um, unfortunately, Republicans seem to always be able to beat them to the punch and set the narrative. And so the Democrats are constantly backpedaling and you don't look at a group of very stressed out, very concerned parents, whether they're concerned about the, the COVID, the, the social um, risks, the education loss, the things that are being taught to them. And you look these concerned parents in the face and tell them, I don't care. You don't, you don't get a say you've lost all of them, all of them, because even if they're not one of the ones screaming about critical race theory, they now know you don't give a shit about their child. Mm -hmm. Because while a parent shouldn't also be micromanaging and dictating syllabi for the professors and teachers, um, they should be able to bring up concerns and voice mm -hmm. problems that they have and there be a, a process to handle it. Not every concern is as valid as others. Um, like, you know, the, the, the specific counties and, and, and municipalities that are going so far as to say that we will fire and fine teachers using the word race or racism. That's ludicrous. Now, if that teacher was, picking up a kid and holding him up against the wall and saying, you're a little racist. Well, then yeah, that's not okay. Right. So it, it depends what is happening. And they're just blanketly screaming about all of these things that are terrible. We need to keep having conversations, I guess is my um, already too long, short answer. We need to keep having conversations with people and not shut them down, hear their concerns, hear their fears. And whether you do you know, whether it's a valid enough thing that there actually needs to be something done or whether they just need to be heard. Yeah. Whether they just need someone to say, I hear you. We are taking that into consideration. We're looking at all our options. And now I realize that what I just said does sound like politicians speak, but we might, we, we shouldn't be expected to always have the answer because that's another problem too. I think that's why we fall into right. that a lot of politicians just give some bullshit concocted answer because they feel like we have to. We're human. I'm not a politician, but I'm a human. I'm a people. I'm a person. I've already lost my train of thought two or three times on here tonight. And we shouldn't be expected to have all of the answers. What you should expect of your representative is if they do not know, I will find out, get back to you and let you know what our options are. Right. It's it. We don't expect also all politicians to have all answers or be able to fix every problem. They need to hear us understand what's going on and try and resolve the issue to the best of their ability with the options that they have. So we need to stop shutting people down, yeah. hear them out and have an honest dialogue so that we can come up with a reasonable solution instead of just boxing people out. Well, that makes me like really sad to hear about that. You know, that's sort of a, a key part of what happened in Virginia because we're at this, we're in this period of time right now where I feel like society in a whole is learning that you can't invalidate someone for their identity. And, you know, what it sounds like what this, the, the person did that was running the, the Democrat, um, invalidated the concerns. Yes, you're right that some concerns might, um, might hit stronger issues that need to be dealt mm -hmm. with and other things are might just be concerns that are sort of unfounded but they but you can't invalidate people's concerns because everybody's right. got their own experience everybody's got their own thing they're stressing about and you can't you can't say that um you're not valid because the thing you're stressing about is silly they're still stressing and they're still worried about it and exactly. you need you need to address them in a way that says i i hear you and i understand that you're stressed about this um and you know <laughs> and help them kind of assuage that, you know, help them work through that in some right. way. And don't just, don't just push them off and say, that's, that's silly because it's a real concern for them. You can help yeah. show them how it's, it's not something they need to be concerned about, but you can't Bingo. tell them that it's, it's not a valid concern. Exactly. And, and, that, and you can't do that if you shut down the dialogue immediately by telling them they're stupid or wrong. Yeah. You, when you call people a basket of deplorables, they're not going to listen to anything else you have to say. There you go. Um, let's see. Lots of stuff. We've got... <laughs> um, we stepped on the thing with the uh, bathroom um, thing we've got there. Um, let's go a little fun, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll break it up a little bit. We'll get into some fun stuff, and then we'll go back to some of the more serious stuff. Um, 
what are your favorite movie genre and favorite movie that is from both uh, Shy, um, just so you know, that, that identifies as non-binary. We'll get into that in a second, a little bit deeper. Sure. And um, Mimi, uh, our director of media, she, her. Oh, awesome. Hi, Shy, Mimi. Um, so I would say my favorite genre of movie is like thriller, suspense, action type stuff. Um, and I would say that two of my favorites are Identity and Lucky Number Slevin. Um, they are two movies that all the way up until the last five minutes, you're not really sure what you just watched or what is happening. Um, I, I guess I would uh, suspense and psychological thriller. Um, so um, that and then... Um, Fifth Element is always a classic. <laughs> um, okay, so going going into the the bathroom area again, um, Shai had some concerns. I think of when we were talking about um, family bathrooms um, sure. coming from a unique, uh, not unique, but um, you know, often we're again talking a lot of uh, binary trans and when we talk about trans too i think a lot of times the non-binary community will for will forget or will not understand that we're including them in everything that that is trans which you know trans just means across the gender across gender spectrum um but but uh they ask um if the gender neutral bathroom is also a family bathroom how do you think parents are going to treat non-binary people um, which the bathroom is also for. How would you explain that? Um, how would you kind of explain that issue? Um, I, I think maybe what I would like to do is get a little bit more from from Shy on that. But is there something in there that you feel that you could talk about that um, where maybe a non-binary person it feels left out of the of this huge debate and discussion about transgender folks in bathrooms? Sure. So um, what I would say is that, uh, first of all, Shai, I absolutely hear your concern um, and that that is a valid one. And I'm, I think what I was trying to speak on is a general response for the various options that we have for bathrooms. Like I said, that not, not every building has more than two bathrooms. And so for them, it would probably make the most sense to make them both gender neutral. Um, but in the places that are larger, we should, should have a variety of options. Um, the family bathrooms really only come into place where there's usually kids. So like there's no family bathrooms at college campuses there. They have male, female, or gender neutral. Um, and so, um, I absolutely do not, um, exclude non, non-binary people in, in this discussion because when I'm talking about this and, and so you're absolutely right, Emily, when, when we're not necessarily mentioning the, the communities that we're speaking of, they don't always know that, that we're including them. Um, but so that is why my ultimate goal would be for the places that are able to have um, respectively a male, female and a, and a gender neutral one, like I say, at college campuses and at places where there, there isn't a need for a family bathroom. And then at larger places like stadiums and things like that, where there's hundreds of bathrooms and always going to be kids, those are places where you could have all of the above. You could have male bathrooms, you could have female bathrooms, you could have gender neutral and family bathrooms. Um, but not all facilities are going to be able to, to provide that for us. And so for the places that can't, I think that's where we need to have grace and understand that a small business that only has two bathrooms built into it can't build on a whole addition to give us a third bathroom. And so we've just got to do the best we can with what we've got in some situations. And if we don't feel comfortable going into a bathroom that is, is family um, because we don't want to deal with that interaction and we're not, not ready for that. Um, I, I fully understand. And I, I hope that we are able to find somewhere else uh, safe to use the bathroom because I know that not only for trans and non-binary people, but for the un unhoused and the underhoused um, bathroom access is a huge problem. Um, safe access, clean access, and, and bathroom access. Um, so uh, what I would say, Shai, is that it would have to be a case-by-case -case basis and that we need to be pushing our municipalities to do the best that they can with each specific locality um, 
to accommodate all communities um, that are needed. But we also need to understand when that, that can't necessarily happen um, and, and find a, a safe place for us if, if we don't feel safe. Um, because I would say that you have no more chance of running into a disgruntled mom or dad in a family bathroom than you do as I did running as a male presenting person walking into a female bathroom where the woman is changing her baby uh, in the changing station, which is usually in the female bathroom. Um, so unfortunately, Shai, that's just something that we might run into in a variety of instances. And the best thing that we can do is just trying to make sure that we're hearing everybody and in as many places as possible, mm. put as many bathrooms four different groups as, as we can. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it, I don't have the answers and I still deal with it as well. It's, I, I'm so sorry. No, um, and we, we actually got a follow up on it kind of to, to clarify. Um, okay. um, and, and, and more to the point of, of it. Um, and I'll, I'll just, I think I mentioned it. I don't, I don't know that we, we need to dive too deep into it. We're running short on time. You haven't much, had much chance to talk about your political, um, uh, your your focus your goals there um but shai says i just see many um the, the basically see the potential of many parents utilizing neutral bathrooms um to a great extent or those not wanting to share a bathroom with the trans people uh with with trans people uh, people so um, they will utilize those gender neutral bathrooms to the point of where like we can't well, like, there's just a, a huge line out there um you know and, uh, and that 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 is that is a concern, and I've had I've actually heard similar arguments from the uh, uh, disabled access community that the, um, the 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 changing station is always in the handicap stall. So if there's a mom in there changing their their baby that's not handicapped, the person in a wheelchair can't go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I would just say again, um, um, it, it it could it could be an issue. But then if the parent is taking their, their child into a gender neutral bathroom because they don't, like I said, as, as a dad that doesn't want to take a little girl into, into a male bathroom, um, that I don't know that I would think that you would think that they would understand because they don't want to take their kid into the male bathroom either. So why do we want to go into the male bathroom? Um, but unfortunately, understanding doesn't always come that easy. Mm -hmm. um, Shai is a very, very valid point. Um, and so we should keep pushing for family specific bathrooms, you know, uh, and, and gender neutral ones as well um, in, in the places that, that can accommodate them. I just, I fear that it's, and this is where we get pushed back on is that, Oh, it's unrealistic for you to think we're going to put five bathrooms in every building for you. Um, and so I just think it's clear that we state that, you know, the entire world isn't going to reform to accommodate transgender people. But we can reasonably request that changes be made where they can. Yeah, yeah. In the, in those cases that they can, I I I I appreciate that very much. Um. So, in our remaining few minutes, and the people in in the chat are already asking for a second episode, and I said, yeah, maybe like one in person. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. That's awesome. I'm glad you like what I'm rambling about over here. Yeah. Uh, so we we talked briefly about um, I think more in the in the intro on um, the the culmination of the things that sort of lit your fire to to go out and and be politically active. Mm -hmm. um, as that was happening, what are some of those things that started to form for you that that were your that make up now to this this day still the kind of the core of your political aspirations and, and core of your, your core political uh, values? Sure. Um, so I actually was a non voter for most of my life. Um, inactive voter. I was part of the silent majority that believes that our vote doesn't matter. It doesn't count. Our politicians are just going to do whatever they want anyway. Um, and while uh, I still very much so believe the third point, um, I know very differently now about our vote and our voice and how extremely important it is. And um, it was a young gentleman by the name of Bernard Sanders hanging out right here in my background um, in, uh, in 2016 that really shook me awake. And 
Um, it was the first time I'd ever heard a politician speak like that. The first time I'd ever seen a politician roll up his sleeves and knock on doors with people and actually fight for something other than himself and his own profits and, you know, to get rich. Um, and so I joke that it's been a slow burn ever since. Um, I, you know, as, as you read, I, I, in 2016, I volunteered at the polls. By 2019, I was working at my county election office. I put on three elections last year, uh, two years ago now in 2020, all throughout the pandemic, um, making sure that the people not only in our county, but in the state of California had safe, fair and secure elections. And we absolutely did that. Um, <clears throat> so I've now seen um, kind of the political, the political experience from a, a voter, from a poll worker, from a person putting on the elections and, and now as a person running. Um, and so um, that has been an awesome experience seeing all of the different aspects. And the more I learned, the more angry I got, the more frustrated I got. And the so Bernie was uh, 2016 to 2020 was was a slow burn with Bernie. And then he dropped out pandemic screeching halt our country. Um, it basically for me, the pandemic exposed the rotten core of our system. It was already there. And some of us knew and we, we were all kind of like, like, how common was it like, oh, yeah, if, a poli if it's a politician, they're corrupt, right? It's just, it was just accepted that everything was bad. Yeah. But even with that, I don't think we really knew the depth of the rot that had been eating away at our country. Um, and I truly feel like I watched our representatives at every level of government abdicate their responsibility to protect and provide for the people of this country um, in their failures to the, to the pandemic response and then what the pandemic response exposed with our supply chain issues, our fragile economy, our failed manufacturing state, our inability to produce or provide anything for ourselves. Um, and, and all of these things were exacerbated and all of everybody just pointing the fingers at somebody else. I don't care what side you're on, you're pointing at somebody else. And, and I'm tired of the round Robin. And so um, watching all of this happen, um, protesting at my, my former, uh, my representative's house, um, the, uh, for the Congress, uh, our congressional representative's house, um, last summer demanding they, they pass, um, you know, pay employee wages, um, give us all health care, pay, you know, cancel rents and all of that. Um, and then three months later, and just, just the silence was deafening. We signed petitions, we protested, we called, we need you. Our food lines are exploding. Our homelessness numbers are going through the roof. The, um, all of the shelters are at max, um, a, a private, it's a, it's a, independent organization that's private but works with our local county that does a food share and that does a food banking, they had to step up and create an entirely drive-through food distribution system because the pantries were overburdened and everything. And just so all of this. And then um, October rolls around and I'm getting emails every day from our representative that has done nothing for us begging me for money and telling me how a Republican's going to steal her job and ruin the country. And I just lost it. Mm -hmm. I just absolutely lost it. I said, you have done absolutely nothing for us and are now begging the people who are so poor, we can't feed ourselves for money when you have $3 million sitting in the bank. And I just, I just lost it. I just absolutely lost it. I went and filed um, I was still working full time at the time. And I just said, I said, we, we can't do this anymore. It's time that we stop electing politicians and we start electing people and working class people because it is the, the people that labor, it is the people in domestic service, it is the people who wait tables and make clothes and manufacture that we are the ones who know and experience the extreme hardships that are experienced that, that are exist because of the decisions that the people at the top make. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just couldn't keep screaming into the void anymore. 
and and not trying to have a seat at the table to be the voice of the working class people for the working class people, just to be a catalyst, a megaphone. I do not ever intend to speak for people, but I do hope to speak and share stories of people and to bring them up so that we can all speak and share our stories. Um, I grew up um, poor, raised by a single mom who had to make decisions about whether to buy me Christmas presents or pay the mortgage um, and started working at 14. And, you know, like you said in my intro, job after job, by the time I was 19, I was already working three jobs at the same time. And just, it, there was no end in sight to that. Um, I couldn't afford to go to college at the time. There was nothing but minimum wage slavery for the rest of my life. And in Maryland, they still have a tipped minimum wage. I was making two seventy-five an hour as a bartender. Two seventy-five. I don't know if everybody heard me say that. Two dollars and seventy-five cents an hour. It is legal to pay a human in the United States of America in two thousand and eight. That's when I was making these wages because in Maryland they say you make tips. So we're not paying you a minimum wage. Problem is, when you live in a community that's just as poor as you, you are lucky if you get two cents on a dollar. Mm -hmm. And then you can't even be mad at the people who can't tip you because they're struggling just like you are. But now you can't gas up your car to go home. Well, if you have never had to decide, they, 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 they fooled themselves and tricked all the rest of us that these rich well-educated elite assholes know better than us. And so they should be leading us. And this, this goes all the way back to the founding. That's why they did the electoral college because they didn't trust the stupid masses to vote for ourselves. But if you, what I truly believe that if you have never had to make a decision between insulin and food, between your rent and gas, that you don't understand what the people of this country are going through and you cannot adequately legislate to help us because you don't even know how much a banana costs because somebody grocery shops for you. They really thought that $600 payment was enough to sustain people for months. My rent's 2000 for one month. That's a whole other thing we can get into about why we why our well, generation can't afford to buy houses. Well, you know, and, and one of the, the key things is that you've kind of, you know, you've talked about, you've alluded to, um, the country has bought into this idea that um, people who have run business and our CEOs should be our our you know um, and and have been you know these these business moguls have been super yeah. successful and that's the type of person that should run the country and there's been this big belief and this major push um, to run the country like a business yeah, um, they've actually said that out loud. Everything. And um, we've seen all the all the ways that that business is bad because it doesn't consider people at all. Um, Absolutely. And but what they've that what they've done is they've they've skewed everybody's perspective away from this fact, um, which is what you know Bernie Sanders brought out so brilliantly and, and what he fought so strongly for and what i think um occupy wall street kind of tried to do is to point yeah. out that it's it's the rich elites that are running everything um that right are that ground. are you know doing all the bad things but what they're good at is that they're always good at pointing to the other side is the bad guy that it's the oh, republicans right. this time so then everybody votes for for a democrat and then the other side says, look at, uh, you know, the Democrats are terrible. Democrat and so it's a Republican. Is. And so we just bounce back and forth between these yeah. two um, identical types of people with slightly different, not even slightly different views, but different ways of approaching things and yeah. ways of talking to the points um, that, you know, we just, we just keep electing the same person over and over again. So it's a great yeah. point that you bring up, like, we need people in there, not you know, we need workers, not business owners, not these these people that have somehow, um, because they had a silver spoon in their mouth, been able to achieve so much because they had such a huge leg up. And therefore, they look appealing to us and they yeah. are educated to the point where they know how to say the exact right thing instead of being allowed to kind of fumble and go like, well, let me let me look into that and be honest and 
and real out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I, th- I think that we absolutely need to start working to uh, elect more, more working class people and, and move away from that, that ignorant dichotomy that, that the, 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 the rich and the elite somehow know better when we can look around us and see clearly what they have just absolutely destroyed. Um, and it, it only works as long as they have an other. And um, that's why all of us others need to come together <laughs> because um, they just rotate through us scapegoats and through us villains. If, it, if it's not the immigrants, it's the gays. If it's not the grays, gays, it's the trans. And then they then it's the terrorists and then it's the it's the Russians because we're back to we're about to start another Cold War again. I cannot. Our politicians operate in a currency of fear or our politicians operate in a currency of problems. If there's no problems, we don't need them. So there's no vested interest and there's no money to be made in solving the problems that we have, because then there's nothing to campaign on. If they solve climate change and give us health care, what are these lying ass Democrats going to run on saying that they want to give us affordable health care? No, free, free, single payer health care, free. Tired of that bullshit. That's another thing. Oh, everybody should have access to affordable health care, guaranteed health care for all. We will not accept less. And what I do like is that us on the left, we're starting to flip this, that for so long, we've been painted as radical for wanting people to not have to suffer and not be exploited and not be abused and just have the basic necessities. Like It is an indisputable fact that people work, learn and function better when they have their basic needs met. So what blows my mind is that it's actually in these capitalist assholes' best interests to make sure that we're healthy and well-educated. They should be sending us to school. They should be making sure we have a gym membership. They should be making sure we have good health care because you know what? Then I'm going to produce more for you, which means you're going to make more money. But instead, they've got it all backwards where they have to keep these things broken. They have to keep these things problematic because then they get to campaign on it. Right now, I am absolutely convinced that the Democrats have no intention of winning anything because they've made more money in the last four years off of campaigning against Donald Trump than they've ever made. So it's just this, that guy's bad, vote for me. And if you don't have anything other than I'm not that guy, vote for me, then get the hell out of here. We need people who are actually going to fight for something and stand for something. And the point I was trying uh, started to make, then I just sidetracked myself, is that for so long we've all been painted as these crazy radicals because we want people to have basic things. When why aren't we saying that it's radical that we still let people be paid two seventy five or seven twenty five an hour? Why is it not said that it's radical to deny people voting rights? Why is that not the radical point that we are de- that that they want to deny, harm, and keep us poor? But we're radical for wanting to give people health care. We, we, we've we got to flip the dialogue and stop letting the people who want to deny people access to their basic needs. Um, we need to stop letting them dictate the narrative and and really come out stronger and, and, and flip this stuff on its head because they've had the microphone for too long. And so it, it, it's voices like yours and I's that we have to keep screaming as long and as loud as we can to, to, to break the, the, the cognitive dissonance that has proliferated. Sorry. Um, oh, should I, have, I was trying to get caught up on something that was going on in chat because um, it seemed like I, I might have been missing something or whatever. Um, but uh, they're talking about uh, sending transcripts so um, uh, you can read some of the, the chat um <laughs> but get bored with oh, all the cross talk, cross talk before the compliments. Um, uh, yeah, that's something that we haven't really been talking about recently. We can put um, compliments and and comments directly towards the guest in the the question section. Um, and um, you can you can put like uh, mods. You can put like comment in front of it or whatever. Um, I'm totally fine with that being um, ending up in there as well because I'll be able to read through all of it. Um, uh, Daniel, back to you. Like I said, we're, we're over time and I really sure. appreciate the time that you've given so far. So I'm going to end with one big question, unless something else, and, um, while I'm asking this and you're answering comes in from chat, please. Um, if you have anything that's burning, um, go ahead and drop it in there and we'll try and get to it. Um, the last question that I have is you're running for state assembly. Um, if you're elected 
what does that give you the power to do? What are some of the things that you will then have the ability to do? And what are your focus? What are you focusing on? So many good things. Okay. So what is awesome about running here in the state of California is that we, again, I, this is the theme of the night, fortunate. We are very fortunate here that we have a couple things that don't exist in other states. One, we have open primaries. So I'm actually running as a nonpartisan candidate. And the, way, the reason I have the ability to do that is because we have open primaries. So I don't have to bow down or kowtow and get the nomination and the blessing of any party. I merely have to get the petition. I have to get signatures on a petition from my local community member saying they want to see me on the ballot. With that, we have other awesome, we have something very similar to that with our legislative process. So here in California, we have already moved in the direction that the rest of the country should be heading in. We had already $12 an hour minimum wage. It's now been increased to 14 for small businesses, 15 for big businesses. This year it went into effect. We've already, we are this close right now. CalCare is in its second to last stage on being voted on. We are possibly uh, 12 days from having guaranteed health care here in California. Um, we have already voted to legalize marijuana, restore the voting rights to formerly incarcerated peoples, and um, implement term limits and campaign finance limits on our politicians here. Those are all things that the people of California voted to enact as laws. So I get to go to the state house and I get to fight for, because I know our voters already support it. They've already pushed us up to 15. We're going to fight for $20 an hour minimum wage. We're going to mandate that nobody in California sleeps on the streets. Everybody gets some kind of safe dwelling. Doesn't mean everybody gets a mansion. That means that for everybody's needs, that they will have a safe dwelling. Um, because to be honest, people talk about putting a bunch of veterans in high rises. They don't want that. They'll freak out. PTSD. It's not good. They want to live like in their own little like built hut. That's fine. We can help them do that. Right. So it's not a one size fits all. Everybody though should have, we need to mandate that it is unacceptable to, for any municipality to allow people to knowingly sleep on the streets. So we can mandate, we need to do $20 an hour minimum wage. We can do uh, homeless mandate to make sure that everybody is is in a house and that the, the municipality is the one responsible, not the individual person. We can also do a California climate deal here. We've already got the highest emission standards in the country as far as our vehicles. So again, we are already, our voters here in this state already want this stuff. We're already voting for it and enacting it. We just have to take the next steps. My favorite part about shifting from, and we didn't really go into this a lot, but when I initially started to run, I was running for Congress, which is actually why there's a little trip up at the beginning. I think I forgot to pull that part out. Um, but um, I, I really wanted to go do these, these big, huge changes because we do have so much good things here in California. I wanted to take and expand that to the rest of the country where I know damn well that a lot of the states don't have anywhere near the infrastructure and the, and the systems in place that we do. Um, however, as we're seeing and have been seeing for more than a decade now, the gridlock in Washington gets nothing done. So as um, Emily talked about earlier, the, the gerrymandering of the district is why I decided to pull back from Congress and shift and run for assembly. But as soon as I made that decision, the most amazing things just came into mind. Like everything I'm saying, we can't get $15 an hour at the, at the federal level. We've already passed it here in California. Now we need to go for 20. They won't pass the PRO Act, which is a Protecting the Right to Organize Act at our federal level. We can do a California Protect the Right to Organize Act. And unlike the national bill that, will, that excludes and does not include immigrants, agricultural, domestic, or farm workers, we will make sure that all of those people are included in our legislation here in California. The reason they do that is because that's the only reason that that's the only way that they can get um, Republicans to vote for um, any type of labor rights bills is to make sure that they exclude the immigrants. We won't do that here in California. We need to make sure that things are better. So we have a lot of opportunity where I thought that I needed to go make this huge, big, massive national change. What we're actually seeing, learning, and realizing is that the president, Congress, Senate, what they do doesn't usually affect our day-to-day -day lives. It's our supervisors. It's our city council members. It's our parks. Um, it's our parks and rec who decide what what um, what parks get renovated. It's our water district who decides how clean our supplies are. 
It's our local municipalities and our state and local governments that have the largest and most direct impact on us. So while I was nervous about making this change and unsure about how things were going to go, the ideas, opportunities are endless on what we can do because the voters here in California are hungry for it. Now, the favorite part that I didn't get to finish answering earlier, just like we have open primaries and I can get on the ballot without the, the party nomination, here in California, we also have something where residents can write legislation. Now, it's a big undertaking and you have to get millions of signatures throughout the entire state. But as a resident, you can draft legislation. So what we can do is we take all of this legislation to the state house. We cannot get these assholes to stand up and fight for the people over profits and um, stick it to the corporate interests, get rid of fossil fuels and all of these um, things that are dictating our policies right now. Then we say, okay, fine. We're going to go write a ballot initiative and we're going to do a statewide campaign and tell every person in this state that we are going to give them health care, whatever, whatever the bill is. So that if the state legislature won't fight for $20 an hour and they won't pass $20 an hour minimum wage, we're going to take it to the people. And I guarantee you that if you go door to door and say, will you sign this petition because I want to give you $20 an hour into your job, you will have the greatest success that we have ever had. That stuff will never get shut down. It's only the people who already have denying those who don't more. That's, That's wonderful to hear. I'm I'm encouraged about up. I'm encouraged about um, what that means, and if if we if we do get you into office, that um, you know the effect that you'll be able to have for the yeah. state. And then you know you. I think you you sort of alluded alluded to it that um, you know if if we can set standards in our state, hopefully that'll help trickle to other. Oh, I shouldn't have said that word. Um, it, it'll yeah, help. I'm trying to stop using that too. <laughs> Because we don't want anything to trickle down. No, because um, it doesn't. Um, but uh, actually, here's, if, here's here's the best way that somebody just described it to me recently. Um, we're the stone in the lake. We're the stones throw in the lake that starts the ripples. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and that's what I say about CalCare. I say CA leads the way because um, something that's incredibly unique about this single payer universal health care plan is that there's actually written into the bill funding set aside to mandate cultural competency in our providers, meaning that they need to know how to address people with different pronouns. They need to know how to examine um, a trans male that has had a hysterectomy. They need to understand that even though it has been misconstrued for such a long time, that black women actually don't have a higher pain tolerance because of their skin color um, and that they need less medicine and those things. There are, those are still commonly held misbeliefs where when uh, it, black males as well, but especially black women, they deal with this a lot when they're going through birth and delivery where they are told that they are, when they reach out in pain saying that they need something, they are often ignored or diminished as saying, oh, it, you know, you'll be fine. Just breathe through it. Just breathe through it. Where if it had been somebody of a different of a different um, race, skin color, or nationality, that um, they would have gotten that treatment. And it actually there is statistically shown an increase in infant mortality because of Black women not getting the care that they need. So CalCare and the way what I describe this as is putting our legislative money where our political mouth is. We talk about this is supposed to be universal and take care of any, everyone. The only way that we do that is by mandating that all providers must go to this training and meet certain <clears throat> criteria and requirements or they will not receive funding. And mm -hmm. the funding, the, the training is paid for in the bill so that they can't even say, oh, well, I'm not going to go pay for this extra training. No, you're going to and we're going to pay for it because you need to treat everybody equally and with respect. And so, I mean, I've never seen anything like that at a state level, let alone a national level where they mandate in there, hey, we're gonna make sure you treat everybody right. And we're gonna put in the money and the resources to make sure that this actually happens. And so I think that's just a perfect example of how we can really do things differently here at the state level and set a brand, set a, set a better precedent than, than the, the, the status quo that's been destroying us for so long. 
this is gonna um this is gonna take a take a minute, but um I just wanted to interject here on this point of like thinking about if you pass um you know free universal health care, you've um solve homelessness so that everybody in the state has a bed, um you get a a, a living minimum wage for ev every every employee, um and then in that that health care you provide for things like abortions and and you know um patients rights essentially um it's possible that what will happen is there'll be su such a flood and an influx of people moving to california out of these states that they'll be forced to to listen and make some of these changes yeah absolutely and and right now they use this counter argument of the opposite that, oh, if we do, you know, the, this is the argument with raising the minimum wage or raising taxes on businesses. Oh, well, they'll just leave. They'll just move out of state. Go then. I don't go. If, if that if, and what what the truth of the matter is in this, they, they constantly talk about, you know, how cow care or health care for all will. You know, it'll destroy jobs and and it'll destroy competition and it'll destroy freedom of choice when all of those are absolutely wrong. And we can have a whole session on that because that's a long conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what we need to do is shoot. I, I lost my train of thought. You asked me, what am I going to do next? What, what do we do after that? Oh, no, um, oh, so everybody's going to leave. No, <laughs> I think that's what's I think that's exactly what's going to happen is that. Once we have guaranteed health care here for any resident, and I think you only have to be, you only have to live here for six months or a year. Mm -hmm. um, we see, I mean, we see it right now. California residents go to Tijuana and Mexico all the time. Um, people in the North, uh, all along the Northern border, go up to Canada to get insulin cheaper. Bernie famously went on a tour up there to do so. It cost $350 here. They got it for 12 bucks. Same thing, same exact thing. Um, so yeah, I think there will be a flood of people to California and I think that's exactly what we need, not necessarily in the big cities. What I love is that we're flooding to different places now and, um, us millennials are a huge part of that where we're, we're not, we're not being forced to live in these big cities and, um, the being able to work from home has shifted that for a lot of people too. We saw a huge exodus of especially millennials, um, moving out of the big cities and into more rural um, smaller towns just trying to live the, the quiet life and take care of their family um, because they can afford to live out there. And so, but then I've, I've got a, a, a buddy that, that does a podcast in, uh, he's going to come in, he's Montana, um, where um, they have only one Congress congressional representative for the entire state. Just to tell you how few people there are. Mm -hmm. But as us, us, us Westerners and us people fleeing the big cities have moved in, their rents have gone through the roof. Their prices have gone up. Um, and I don't have an answer for fixing that, but we definitely need to have a better regulation of our economic market um, because <sighs> inflation and, and prices rising for the cost of things is one thing, but we have s factual evidence that the corporations are just exacerbate, ex massively jacking up prices and using the inflation crisis as a scapegoat. Um, because they're making record profits. And if costs were really that much higher, you wouldn't be making any profits. You would just be surviving. A couple of quick comments as we as we close up here. Sure. Um, first off, um, uh, Shai says that we are we are loving this. And the fact that the numbers haven't really varied the entire time we've been on um, definitely backs that up. Um, they also ask... Um, um, the trans nice. politics show, question mark, question mark, question mark. And I said, yes, Daniel is open to it. We've already spoken about it. And they follow that up. And that hasn't happened yet because um, <laughs> I know um, my reason. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> let's put you on the spot here and see um, uh, where you're at on that idea. Um, I'm fully open to it. The person that I was thinking was going to be doing it with me might not be able to now, um, but that is definitely in the works. I would ask everybody to stay tuned. I would love uh, for um, Emily and the transverse to allow us to be on. Um, if I'm able to get that going, it would mostly be probably be hosted on, on my YouTube channel or whatnot, but I'm definitely open to partnerships with, with Emily and the, and the transverse and um, definitely collaborating with the, with the transgender show specifically. Um, uh, open invitation, Emily, if you want to start another podcast. <laughs> um, 
But uh, no, I, I, I think that um, I'm trying to decide also what kind of, because I don't know if I wanted to specifically be uh, trans podcast uh, or trans politics only because mm-hmm. um, my goal is to talk to as many different people and as many different walks of life as possible um, and come together on solutions rather than fighting about, um, I don't know, Mr. Potato Head or Big Bird getting the vaccine. Like, yeah. No, nobody, nobody cares about that. What's, what's, um, gas is, gas is too expensive and we can't afford to, to pay rent. Right. So that whether you're white, black, brown, or green, whether you are, uh, um, a Republican or a Democrat, I was about to say rich or poor, but no, mostly just poor. Um, that, that is the one, that is the one, um, yeah. that is the one, usually the rich are fine. But, um, other than that, that, that actually really, and that, that, that it belies the point that it, the working class across all spectrums need to come together in solidarity. They've, they've intentionally kept us apart for so long that, you know, we've got trans groups over here, black groups over here, Spanish groups over here, queer groups over here. And it's like, we're all fighting against the same stuff. Yeah. Why are we not coming together? Um, so definitely moving towards a political podcast that will definitely highlight and focus on trans and queer issues. Um, but not sure about the name, um, if we can throw trans in there. Not that I'm necessarily opposed to it, but. No, um, and, and I don't, I don't want to, you know, give you the false representation that that's, that that's required. Um, you know, we, yeah. we, you are not super familiar with what we do with the, the transverse yet. You haven't um, dove in very deeply. Um, we'll get yeah. you in there. But um, yes, we're, this is the, the transgender show and it's the right. transverse. So we've got it in the name, but the, the key is having folks having representation of of the trans experience so it's not about talking about trans political issues if you're the the predominant host on a show like that and um, that's the representation that uh, satisfies it still not back i wonder if he's there are you are you listening to me at all yeah i'm listening okay good, sorry good. i was trying to get something on my eye perfect and I, I didn't want to be digging my eye on the camera i switched to a screen where it was just me and i was covering it but then i'm just like i hope daniel can actually hear me um yeah but yeah, the, the focus doesn't have to be trans issues. I think it's sure. important to have those at some point because yeah. they're, they're, they're big right now. But no, I don't want you to give you the impression that um, it has to be all trans all the time. You, as, a, as a trans host of that, um, your perspective's already in there. So, um, and, you know, talk- I, forget, I forget that a lot, that it's, it's kind of baked in. And yeah. people remind me that because they're like, why? And, you know, I had somebody push back that like, because I introduced myself as trans, right? I'm, I'm very open about this. I'm not trying to um, in any way uh, trick or, or hide anything, um, not only because I don't want people to feel that they're tricked, but also we shouldn't have any reason to hide. We should be living our out open best lives. Um, and But I had I had a friend push back that like, oh, you, you shouldn't say trans is like the third thing in, in your opening speech. And I'm like, why not? I, I'm running as trans. And um, uh, another friend that was there pushed back and was like, whether he's talking about being trans or just talking, he's still trans. So everything that comes through is filtered through his, his, his trans existence. And I guess that's actually going back to the question you asked me earlier about um, my experience and, and tying that into politics. Every policy that I'm fighting for is something that has impacted me, me personally. Yeah. And, and so the, and so you're absolutely right. What, what I'm talking about, what I'm fighting for, whether it be, you know, trans specific, veteran specific, working class specific, um, they're all my, my identities and my existence. And so you're absolutely right. Whatever I bring to the table will be at least being discussed through a, through a trans lens. Yeah. And like I said, it doesn't have to, to, to be super trans specific. Like as, as long as you're the the main host, then, then that's fine. You can have a co-host that, that isn't necessarily trans and you can talk about all issues around politics. I just think it would be a lovely thing. And, you know, some of the things you were talking about, uh, about bringing in people from all walks of life with the exception of possibly the, um, the rich white, (laughs) rich white cis male. Um, uh, we need to talk to that asshole too, though. Yeah. 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 But, um, I think there's a ton of value in that. I think our audience would love it. And I would still definitely love to, to dive into that. Um, Mimi says we need a team of uh, political commentators. It'd be great if we, yes. had, if we had a, a panel. And then, and then like, if we had a panel, like, it wouldn't necessarily mean you'd have to be on every show. We kind of switch things up a little bit. That could be kind of cool. But um, some great love, ideas to I think about. I would love to be a recurring guest on a panel. Mm-hmm. Just put that out there. Um, 
And then um, just so you know, and I and I I shouldn't be talking about this because I'm gonna jinx the damn thing. Um, because we haven't we haven't solidified it yet, but I am in talks with uh, Andrea Jenkins' team about oh, getting oh, wow. um oh. about getting okay. her on okay. um, this show. Fantastic. Um, and then um, I don't know, maybe maybe we you know if we can build um, enough of a bridge, if we can uh, develop enough of a relationship, maybe that's a um a, uh, another potential person to have in. Um, yeah. Oh, and I absolutely. Um... I was just going to say um, uh, something that I've been wanting to, and I'm not sure how to connect with them, but I feel like they would be open to um, before when I was thinking about it, talking to me, but especially talking to you and, and perhaps being on your show as well, because what I'm just realizing is I, I don't think, first of all, that there is a trans, any trans political show at all. So that's actually a really good idea having a trans host. Um, but then also um, um, there are already two transgender um, women that are um, state representatives in Delaware and Virginia, um, Sarah McBride and Danica Rome um, mm. are, um, Danica Rome was the first, um, she was uh, elected to basically my, what I'm, what I'm running for, but in Virginia, the Virginia state house. And then um, Sarah McBride, she was, uh, Danica Rome was elected in 2018. It was just reelected again in 2020. Um, and then, um, Sarah McBride um, is the uh, first trans state senator um, in the state of Delaware. Mm -hmm. and she got elected in 2020. Um, that was part of my uh, my pride uh, announcement speech. Um, was I was like, um, 2018 we we hit the state house. 2020 we hit the 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 fed um, the senate. Um, now we're going on. We're going big. We're going bold. We just got to keep going with with more trans representation. Um more probably a discussion offline. Um, Mia Mason is someone I'm going to put you in, in touch with. Do you know that name? Not off the top of my head, no. Ran for Congress in Maryland, I believe. Oh, um, that's, my, that's my home. Yeah. Mar Mia Mason for Marylanders. Yeah, 20-year military veteran. Um, working to restore equity in our equality and equity in our communities. Heck yeah. Uh, she lost, but got 143,000 votes and her opponent, um, I, I think incumbent, won 160 some odd. So really close um, race for a grassroots campaign. Um, she, I have talked to her about you. She says you can contact her. Um, we will need to work on her in, in tandem and, and um, see if we can get her as part as it, of this show we're talking about. Because sure, I'd love, I love that. It. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'd be happy to be put in connection with, with anybody with any kind of experience like that because um, the, the learning curve on being a... Uh, working class, non-political candidate is steep. Yep, yep. Um, we're doing, we're doing, we're doing our best here. Um, and we've, we've got some community support, but yeah, there's a learning curve. So um, any support that, or advice that I could get from somebody who's been through the ringer, I would greatly appreciate mm -hmm. the connection. Uh, yeah, Shai, unless, unless Minvani knows someone else, Mia okay. is the one that she put me in touch with. Um, Jess, um, Jess asks, it, are you working with the Victory Fund for support in your race? Um, Danica and uh, she knows Danica did. Not sure if Sarah did, but pretty sure. I believe Sarah did as well. I am else. currently filling out that endorsement application. So not yet working with Victory Fund, but already working on that endorsement application. So we're um, currently keeping you from getting your form done is what you're telling no, me. <laughs> no, you're not. Not at all. Uh, no worries. This this is this is um, very important um, and exciting for me. I love um, not only connecting with um, you know people on, a, on an intellectual level and the things that, that that we're discussing, but also engaging with with the community and people that have questions that uh, don't always get you know a way to ask. So no, this is great. I'm I'm enjoying myself. Awesome. Um, I think uh, as as we go further, I I, I the, the longer we go, the more I owe Nancy basically. <laughs> maybe a little bit maybe a little bit she did just get home a little bit ago she was working so okay you have to um, take up too much of her time um shy had commented i want to hit this um um well there's a, there's a couple we'll get to real fast and then and then we'll cut it I, I i i swear um daniel seems to be honestly able to hear stories of the community and help others see and find compromise for both sides that was a comment from shy um, and then Brianna okay. asks, I think this is a, a super softball question, but maybe there's some uh, nuance to it. Um, what's your favorite flag? That one. <laughs> 
Nice. Um, uh, I've actually been going back and forth, um, especially as a veteran. There is not the not, not the sentiment that is currently uh, riding around our American flag. But um, I'm not gonna lie. When I went through boot camp and um, they they pinned us and and they did certain things and they raised the flag, I cried. I absolutely cried. Um, it, I think that was mostly sleep deprivation and survival. But um, for for a long time, um, especially when I was in and after I got out there, what there was a, a bit of a more of a reverence for the flag. Of course, now I just look at it and I feel sad um, that it's been co opted and misabused. Um, we talk about the difference between the Confederate flag and, you know, the American flag. And now I literally walking with people and they're like, oh, there's an American flag at that house. We should go the other way. And I'm like, like, they're not wrong in why they think that and what has happened and what, what, you know, the, but oh, it's just so unfortunate because um, I don't know. And it's, it's just interesting because we've, we've been attacked as the gay community for, stealing the the rainbow from god <laughs> what is it we're not taking anything from god we're not stop it <laughs> um but yeah i i read this crazy article where that 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 the, the rainbow was originally god's and that we 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 were corrupting it and taking it and uh i don't know um there is a thing about people corrupting flat yeah 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 it makes my head hurt um but so um, I, can't, I think it was Bri Brianna that gave me the softball question. So I would say this is my favorite flag because it, it, it includes everybody and it has nothing to do with colonization, conquest, slavery, or death. Um, and it is just about um, bringing everybody in and celebrating our humanity. I'm trying to decide if I want to give you this. I really should let you go. Get it, hit it quick, hit it. Um, my confusion with that, particular flag and it's actually that that is an outdated version there there is a, a newer version that includes the um the intersex um yellow triangle and circle um, okay my confusion with that is i always understood it even when i was outside of the lgbt community before i i understood that i was part of it um i always i always thought that the rainbow meant all and so mm -hmm. it's just, it's odd to me that we have to say all plus these people. <laughs> I know, and I know I, we're included in it. I know trans folks are included in there. Um, black people of color, now intersex. But I just, I just, I just feel like it's, it's unnecessary on top of like all are accepted and loved. Right. And, and I, I can see that point. And there is, and, and that's where, when people say things like, oh, you're changing everything and you just want special treatment, you know, the, I, I always felt included under the rainbow. Um, I, whether I, I was, when I was gay or when I was trans, I've actually just found out about this in, in the last few years. Um, and so I've, I've just always, I mean, they're right here behind me. Um, I've got even on my wall, like my, my portfolio, like, I've just always loved and lived with the rainbow around me. Um, and I never felt excluded. Um, but I'm not going to lie. I did have a smile the first time I saw the pink and blue on the flag. And so I wonder if that's just it. Is it's just like we were talking about earlier, acknowledging and recognizing that, that they exist and to where not just, um, and I don't mean to speak out of turn because I am not of this community, but um, I have friends that have spoken about this, about the acronym BIPOC. It's Black Interracial, uh, Black Interracial. I heard it, I'd heard it as um, Indigenous. There we go. Black Indigenous Pacific Islander. I can't, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm missing it up. Um, um, BIPOC is what, as far as I understand, was black people indigenous black people of color. People of color. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm so sorry. I spaced on that. It's because I removed it from my vocabulary because it shouldn't be there. Um, people who were su supposedly being included in that acronym was like, I don't want to be just relegated to a letter. I am black. You don't need to lump me in to BIPOC. Same with the indigenous community. And they all also have very different experiences. 
the black experience in America is very different from the indigenous experience in America, which is very different than, than the Spanish speaking experience in America. Um, and so there's a need for them to individually be seen, heard and recognized. Um, and so while I, I completely agree with your point to an extent where to me, the rainbow meant and, and included all of us, mm -hmm. um, I can also see people who have for so long not been seen wanting to be and just, Hey, put a circle on the flag. Just, just give me a circle. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the good points on, on both sides. I, I can see that, you know, sometimes we might go in, in not just tr not speaking specifically of the trans community, but people in general can go too far in, in, in asking, expecting or demanding um, something special, but I don't feel like it's something special or too hard when we already create and, and, you know, make these ourselves, this isn't, you know, a national state flag that we have to petition to get changed. Um, so why, why not include our people? I love it. That's wonderful. All right. Making good on my promise. I'm going to let you go. We've got okay. a ton to talk about offline. Um, we have a ton to talk about, um, on, on camera, <laughs> Again, which we'll yeah. have to figure out a way either through a politics show or a second episode to cover all of it. Um, as you okay. get closer to election time, we'll have to find some way to bring you on and, and showcase that if, if nothing else. Um, but hopefully we, we do much, much bigger things together. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel, I love you. I appreciate you for coming on and sharing so much of your story and giving yeah. us an insight into your political aspirations. Thank you so very much, Emily. I love and appreciate you too. Um, it has been a treasure getting to know you and connecting with you. Um, what fortuitousness that we were both just volunteering and, and at the, the Transgender Day where we are to meet people of our community and celebrate each other. So um, thank you so very much for your time, for this opportunity. I would just like to say that if anybody uh, listening or watching liked what they heard, um, I will definitely be back both on Emily's show, the transgender show, and possibly one of our, our own on the side. Um, but if anybody um, would like to keep up with me and what, what my campaign is doing, um, you can follow me on all of my social medias at Daniel F-O-R-V-C. If you're watching, it's up here behind me. I'm sure Emily will put that up. It was also in the promo video. Um, and you can uh, visit my website at vote, F-O-R, Daniel.com. Um, any type of support you can give, um, spreading, spreading the awareness, sharing our posts, um, signing up for stuff, uh, joining us for vi virtual events, anything. We'd love to see you. We'd love to have you. Um, even if you're not my constituent, you necessarily can't vote for me and be in the area. Um, we can come together across cities, across states, across countries to, to make this world a better place. Um, so thank you all for your time, for being here and, and for your support. Um, we're getting the question specifically, what, what is um, um, your YouTube? Um, everything is Daniel for VC. He did a great job of going through and getting everything with the same, with the same, um, you know, the, the, the same username. Yes. Except his website. And I have called him on that and I'm trying to get it to work. <laughs> um, so um, the only thing is YouTube, the channel is made, but I don't have a hundred subscribers um, and there, there, there aren't videos yet. So um, I did, I did uh, save it, but um, so I would say stay tuned for, for a note from Emily to, to check on my YouTube. When uh, we start doing the podcast, that's where it'll be held um, for right now. There's, there's no videos up there right now. I do.